Welcome everyone to Pure Virtual C++. I'm Cybrand, Microsoft C++ Developer Advocate, and I'll be hosting this conference today. We've got eight great talks lined up on a really wide range of topics, so I hope there'll be something for everyone. All the talks have been pre-recorded, and the speakers will be around both in the live chat and they'll join me for a live video Q&A at the end of their session. Uh, please use the live chat for questions and discussion of the talks, and also just for chatting between the sessions. The live chat will be moderated under the Berlin Code of Conduct, so please just be kind and courteous to the speakers and the other attendees. If you miss something, all the sessions will be available on YouTube after the event, so you can just check them out then. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, who is me. Uh, my background is in compilers and debuggers for embedded accelerators, but I'm also interested in generic library design, metaprogramming, undefined behavior, and making our communities more welcoming and inclusive. You can find me at Tartan Lama on Twitter, and I also have three cats who may or may not make appearances throughout the day. We'll see how we go. And with that, I will get started. Welcome, my name is Sai, I'm Microsoft C++ Developer Advocate, and I'm going to be talking about dynamic polymorphism with code injection and meta classes. For those who aren't familiar with this term, some definitions. Polymorphism itself is the provision of a single interface for entities of different types. So you have one interface you program to, and that will give you different behavior depending on what the types are. Uh, the two types we're kind of concerned with today are dynamic polymorphism and static polymorphism. So dynamic polymorphism is at runtime and static is at compile time. Dynamic polymorphism gives you different behavior based on your dynamic type and static of the compile time type, the static type. And for dynamic polymorphism, the main way we do that in C++ is inheritance and static polymorphism is usually done with overloading or with templates. Now, um, a few years ago, Louis Dion gave a really fantastic talk about dynamic or runtime polymorphism uh, as C++ now. And a lot of the ideas there are kind of the basis for, um, for some of the parts of this talk. Um, so let's see what he has to say about runtime polymorphism. Okay, so he says to listen to Sean Parent instead of him, so let's go back to Sean Parent. And a few years prior to that even, I think this is 2012, Sean Parent did a great talk called uh, Inheritance is the Base Class of Evil, and he's done many similar talks since then. Uh, the idea behind this talk and Louis' talk is that there's a lot of problems with inheritance as a facility for doing dynamic polymorphism in C++, and there are ways which we can try and alleviate some of these. And this is what I'm going to be doing in this talk, implementing better solutions. So some of the problems with inheritance, I would recommend going back and watching these talks uh, if you want more details, but as a kind of simple and, um, description. One of the main problems with inheritance is that you often get dynamic, dynamic allocation where you might not need it. Um, so if we have some kind of hierarchy like this, we have a base class, uh, an A and a B which derive, we can't have a uh, like factory function which returns base by value. We can't store bases in a vector unless we are fine with just slicing off the derived part of an object. This is called slicing if you return a polymorphic, polymorphic object by value. It's just going to get rid of the polymorphic part and you're left with your base part. It's usually not what you want. So we end up doing something like this and returning unique pointers or storing unique pointers, or maybe we can get away with, uh, with storing references if we know the lifetimes here. But this means that we're doing dynamic allocation. We can't usually do like a small buffer optimization or store these things in place without doing a load of extra work which you know it's possible to do but with the the kind of basic fundamentals that virtual functions and inheritance give you it's not right there uh, as i kind of alluded to you also then get the problem of ownership and 
also no ability. So you're, usually we're returning like uh, unique pointers or shared pointers or something. We don't like throwing around owning uh, raw pointers. And sometimes we can decorate these and things like that, but it's something we have to think about. We have to think about the ownership of this resource. And we also might need to think about nullability. Sure, we're getting a unique pointer and we know what the ownership of that is, but can it be null? Do we have to check for this? Um, these are all concerns which we have to think about when we, when we use inheritance. Another problem is that they're intrusive and that they require you to modify the child classes if you want to make the most of inheritance. Well, if you want to use inheritance even at all. So say I have uh, a class, base class in my library and some other library has another class which corresponds to the correct interface. You know, the, the base class has a, a do thing virtual function and other lib x has a, a do thing function. They have the same signature we might want to be able to use x as a base but we can't do that this line will not compile because other lib x does not inherit from my lib base and maybe we can just change other lib x maybe we can't maybe it's code we don't own so then we have to go all the way and write wrapper classes and things like that which again is possible but it's more code it's more work more things to maintain more things to write more things to get wrong. Another issue is that now that we have you know pointers everywhere, we don't have value semantics. We can't copy a base class object without getting rid of the polymorphic stuff, unless we then implement something else on top, like a, a virtual clone interface. Again, something you have to build on top of, of inheritance yourself. And also, we, we have changes in semantics for algorithms and containers. If you want to store a polymorphic object in a std set, for instance, you'd have to provide your own custom comparator object to make sure that you're actually comparing the underlying objects and not just the pointers, unless the pointers are what you want. So those are some of the problems with inheritance. And throughout this talk, I'm going to come back to this list and we're going to try and solve all of these problems and we're going to solve it by essentially implementing inheritance and virtual functions from scratch by hand. Uh, the technique we're going to use is usually called type erasure. And um, if you look at Sean Parent's talks or, or Louis' talks, they have a lot of detail about that as well. This is the hierarchy we're going to be trying to implement by hand. We have a, an animal class which has a, a virtual destructor and one virtual member function called speak. Then we have cat and dog, which override speak. Fairly simple. When you actually want to call a virtual function on an object, because it's, the, the call has to be resolved at runtime, not compile time, we need to store some information in every polymorphic object. So if we have an object called Felix, which is a cat, then this is going to store a pointer to a V table, a virtual table. The V table is essentially a description of how to call virtual functions for a given polymorphic object. And this, this V table is now going to point to, um, to the speak function in cat. So in order to call speak, we need to grab the vtable from our polymorphic object, then grab the member function from the vtable, and then call it. So there's a few levels of indirection. Now, if we're wanting to implement all this by hand, we need to essentially write our own vtable and do all of this indirection manually. And hopefully by doing this and, uh, and playing around a bit, we can get a better solution. What I kind of want this to look like by the end is this. So we have our animal class and that's going to have some magic, which I'm going to gloss over for now. And then our cat and dog objects, uh, cat and dog types are going to have member functions. No, these are not virtual functions. There's no inheritance, but with the, the magic, which is in the animal type, we're going to end up with a use like this. We can just 
create an animal from a cat, we can create an animal from a dog, we can call speak and it will call the right function. Right, so this is how we're going to achieve this. First, we need to say what the V table layout is going to be. So for our, our animal type, we're going to have one speak member function. So we need to say a V table for an animal looks like this. Then we have to define what a V table implementation is for a given concrete type like cat or dog. Then when we construct an animal object, we're going to capture the V table pointer, which we need for a cat or a dog or for something else. And then when we call speak or some other member function, we're going to forward those calls through the V table. And you'll see what all of this looks like in a moment. Again, this is the, the interface which we're trying to, uh, to, to emulate. And we're going to start by declaring our vtable. To start with, we're just going to have two function pointers. So our vtable has one function pointer for um, speak and one for destroy, which is going to call a destructor and um, do any other cleanup we need. These are both taking void pointers because uh, we're going to be passing in the actual concrete object which we're storing and these things are going to be casting internally. But this is all we need for our, our vtable layout. This just says this is what the vtable looks like for an animal. Now we need to fill in these virtual function pointers for our given concrete types. We can do this with a template. If we have a, this is a, a C14 template, variable template even. So what we need here is to store a function which will call speak on the, the correct type and a function which will destroy the object and also call delete because we're going to be managing our own memory in, inside animal. And we can use lambdas for this. It looks kind of ugly, but um, it's not that bad. So these are, are two functions. The first one is just going to cast to the correct type and then call speak. And then the second one's going to cast and call delete. Leave this up for, for just a second so you can have a look. Again, this is just a, a normal uh, variable template. We are capturing the, the type, the, this concrete type, and create generating functions which are going to cast to the correct thing internally. Okay, now that we've captured these, now that we've uh, defined the vtable, we need to capture the vtable pointer for the correct type on construction. So if we have our, our animal type and we're going to store our um, a pointer to the concrete object and we're going to store a pointer to the vtable, then when we construct an animal object, we're going to make the constructor a template and take any type. Uh, you could use a static assert or SVNA here if you wanted, and you could also use perfect forwarding, but this is, you know, slideware. Um, when we call the constructor, we're going to allocate a new copy of whatever we pass in and store that in our concrete object, and then we're in our concrete pointer, and then we're going to capture the V table for the given type. I'll leave us up for another minute. So you've seen the, the V table for there is going to be uh, the variable template, which we defined just here. So we're capturing the pointer for this, this V table. Okay, now that we've done that, we just need to forward our calls on through the V table. And that looks like this. Whenever we call speak, we indirect through our vtable pointer and call speak with um, the, the pointer to our concrete object. And remember, this is going to cast to the right type and call the right function. So it's kind of, um, we're going through a few levels of indirection, but we've 
mostly got to where we want. Now we can have our uh, cat type and our dog type, both with speak functions. And then we can construct our, our animals and call speak. And this will um, allocate, allocate copies of the do cat and dog objects, uh, capture the vtable pointers and forward the calls through. Okay. So these were our problems we had with inheritance and we've solved some of these problems now. Now that we're, um, we're we don't have pointers external to our, our interface, we're handling the memory allocation internally, then we don't have our ownership and nullability considerations. Uh, it's just an object, it can't be null, we know who owns it, it's just managing its own memory. We've also got rid of the um, problem of intrusiveness. Uh, we don't need to modify the child class anymore. We don't need to decorate it with um, saying that, inherit it, that it inherits from the base class. It will all just work. But we still have these three other problems. Uh, we don't have value semantics because we didn't define what it means to copy this thing. Uh, we can't store it in a container for the same object, and we're always doing dynamic allocation whenever you create an animal object. But we can solve some of these. Um, if we want to do value semantics, then we just need to extend our vtable a little bit. We're going to have an additional clone and move clone, and these do mostly what you think. They will just call new and either copy or move, depending on which one it is. Uh, I'll just flash up the implementations. They're, they're kind of messy, but it's pretty much what you would expect. And then inside our animal class, when we copy or move, we are going to call the clone or move clone functions in the vtable, and that will allocate a copy or allocate a move and um, we're gonna you know use the the v table from the object which we're being created with and then you would do the same thing with the the copy assignment and move assignment operators and then we get our value semantics back we can create an animal we can copy into it we can assign it's pretty much what you would expect from a normal value-like interface, but we're using polymorphic objects and it's allocating under the covers. We can also now have a container. And we can iterate over it and we can store cats and dogs and anything else with the same interface and it all just works. So coming back to our list, We've got our value semantics back, and we've also got back the ability to store in containers and use algorithms normally, assuming that we you know, define the necessary comparators and things like that in our, um, in our animal type. So we're only left with one problem. Um, we're not going to solve this for, for a little while yet, but I want to flesh up a little issue with the, the current implementation. And that's the while it's it's giving us a lot of functionality and it's quite usable, the amount of code we have to write is this. Uh, don't try and read it. This is just all the code I've showed you already, but it's just to show you that to achieve this, we've had to write a bunch of boilerplate -y code. And sure, you could get rid of some of this with macros or templates or more complex uh, solutions. But it's not uh, it's not simple to implement. Um, so the rest of the talk is going to be how do we make this easier and also solve that last problem of dynamic allocation. And the first thing we need in order to do that is static reflection. So reflection is the ability of a program to introspect its own structure. So a program being able to ask questions about itself, 
and then use that information in order to achieve, um, to carry out some action. Static reflection, therefore, is the ability to do that at compile time. And we already have some facilities for doing this in C++, uh, mostly out of the type traits header. So we have things like is array, which tells you if some type is an array. And we have is same, which tells you if two types are the same. But there's a few things we can't do. We, we can't take an enumerator and give you the name of it. We can't iterate over the members of a type. And that's pretty much necessary for what we're trying to do. Fortunately, there is a paper called Scalable Reflection in C++, which is uh, being discussed in the committee. You know, reflection has been discussed for a, for a very long time, but it seems like this is the direction which we're going to be going in. And this is what the, the interface looks like. So if we take that example of, um, of generating uh, the string name from an enumerator value, we're going to take in some enumerator and then we're going to loop over all the members of the enum. So to break this down a little bit, the first thing is this reflexpr. This is um, reflecting on the type t. It generates an object which describes the structure of t. And based on this object, we can then use this members of to get a range which represents information about the members of that type. So for an, an enum, that will be all of the different enumerator values. So for every one of those enumerator values, we can check if um, our value is that. This expr ID takes some reflection and turns it into an expression. So, you know, if we had a color enum and red, yellow, green, then using this expr ID on the information for yellow would turn it into yellow, the expression. So we're testing against the value and um, then we're gonna return the name of that enumerator if there was a match. And if we didn't find one, we'll return unnamed or some, some default value. So you can see that this is asking things about the structure of a program at compile time and then doing something based on that. But this isn't quite enough for what we want to do because this is just you know getting information and then exposing that information to the rest of the program. We want to generate code based on the information we read. And we can't just use templates for it because you know, we, we're taking in names, we're gonna be generating code from names and templates don't have facilities for that. So what we need is code injection. As an example, um, see we have this, class point, which has two member data, um, X and Y. And we want to write getter functions for it. I'm not saying you should use getter functions. This is just an example because people understand what getter functions are. Um, now you'll notice that this is a pretty mechanical transformation. We have our X and Y member variables and our member functions are returning those and their name is just prefixed with get underscore. So we could, if we had the right facilities, we could generate this code programmatically. And that's what code injection allows us to do. Would look something like this. This uh, const eval block just says, run this part of the program at compile time. And this generate get function, I'm gonna show you in a second, we're passing in the reflection of point, and this is going to inject our getter functions. Generate getters will look a bit like this. It's a function which takes this meta info, that's the type which reflexpr generates. It's 
a representation of the type or a member or something like that. Any kind of entity which we can represent, um, this represents its reflection. And we're looping over all of the members. And if the member is a non-static data member, then we're going to generate a getter for it. Hopefully this is fairly clear. Um, it's not static data member is just it's like a, a compile time predicate on on this um, reflection information and then generate getter is where the actual magic happens okay some new syntax here and I want to preface this with this is not final syntax this underscore underscore fragment thing looks ugly and it will not be what we end up with in in C++ I really hope so this, um, this arrow starts an injection statement and we're injecting a class fragment. Okay, so the, there's a few different kinds of fragments. There's class fragments, which can be injected into a class. There's namespace fragments, which can be injected into a namespace and block fragments, which can be injected into, you know, like a function or something. Um, and that's just, you know, we have, we have struct after the fragment. So that says this is a class fragment. Okay, and the injection statement is gonna inject some code at the current execution point, where the current execution point in this case is, is this generate getters function. So inside this const eval block, that's where the code we generate is gonna go. Coming back to the code, um, so we want to generate something which looks like this. It won't be exactly this because we want to generate it based on the information we get in, but say we're, say we're given the reflection for the X data member, this is what we would want to generate. So instead of int, instead of hard coding int, we're going to get that information from the reflection. We're going to use the type name of the member's type. So since x was of type int, this will kind of collapse down to int. Then similarly, we don't want to hard code in get x. We want to take the name of the member and we want to prefix it with get underscore. And we do this with unqual id. These, this type name, unqual id, you know, expr id, these are all called reifiers. They take some reflection information and turn it back into something in the uh, the kind of C++ code world. So on qual ID just takes some reflection and turns it into an identifier. And we can prefix it or suffix it or, or whatever. And then inside this member function, we're gonna return the, um, the member as an expression. leave up for just a second. Okay, so now when we call our generate getters function, it's going to generate code, which looks like this. Okay, so now we know how code injection works, or at least the basics of it, we're going to work out how we apply that to our current um, problem of doing dynamic polymorphism. Right now, coming back to our animal class, we want to generalize this. We don't want this to, we don't want to hard code everything by hand. We want to generate the V table. We want to generate the, uh, the V table implementations, everything like that, um, automatically. So we're going to take this animal class and we're going to turn it into a template. I'm going to call it type class for, uh, cause this is pretty similar to, to Haskell's type classes or, um, or Rust's traits. It's, it's a similar kind of idea. So instead of our animal class, we have our type class for template. And the only difference here is we've, uh, we now have a template parameter and our, our V table is parameterized by this facade. So the 
what I'm calling a facade is essentially just a description of an interface. So for animal, it would look like this. Uh, this will never have any implementation. The, the speak function won't have an implementation. It won't have any constructors or data members. It will just be a description of the member functions, which you can call. And then if we wanted our, our animal class like before, we would have something like this. You know, our animal type is just the type class for our animal facade. Okay. And of course you could have any kind of, of facade you want. You could have something with um, multiple member functions with um, member functions with parameters, different return types, and it should all just work. We shouldn't have to write any code to generate things by hand. Now the algorithm we need to go through for doing our code injected virtual functions is exactly the same as before. We're um, declaring what our vtable layer looks like. We're filling in those function pointers. We're capturing the vtable pointers and we're forwarding calls. So getting started on the vtable. This was our vtable before. We had our speed function, destroy, clone, move, clone. Now those last three are going to be the same for uh, for any kind of facade. The only thing which we need to generate from the facade is this speak function, like the speak function pointer. So we're going to make vtable into a template. And now we need to generate this speak function pointer type at, along with any other function pointers which the facade has based on reflection information. So we're going to start off with the const eval block, which again just says to evaluate this at compile time. And now is where the, the magic happens. Uh, don't worry too much about this for each declared function. It's just a, a nice helper which I wrote um, where you give it a reflection and a lambda, and it's going to call that lambda with every member function declared in the facade and it'll give you the function reflection, the return type, and any parameter information. Uh, you can see the implementation of it. I've got a link at the end, but it's not its not that interesting. And then inside uh, this Lambda, for every declared function, we're going to inject uh, a member function pointer type. And again, this is what we want to get out at the end for our speak function, and we're going to I'm going to transform it so you can see what it transforms into. So again, instead of hard coding our void type, we're going to use the type, the name of the return type. Instead of hard coding our uh, our speak identifier, we're going to get the the name of the function from the facade. And if that member function took any additional parameters, then we're going to inject them like this. And this will end up with, you know, void speak pointer and then uh, any parameters. Okay. After we've done that, we need to define what the those V tables look like, the, what the V table function pointers look like for a concrete type. Um, so if we declare an instance of our, our table, then our speak function is going to look like this. This is essentially the same thing as before, but I've expanded it out a little bit. So we want to generate this, um, this table.speak from our facade. So we're going to inject a fragment. This is a, a block fragment. It doesn't have any any struct or class or namespace after the, the fragment identifier. And similarly, we're not gonna use speak. We're gonna use the name of the function and we're gonna inject our parameters and use those identifiers as arguments. And then we're also gonna return 
this function call in case the, the function we're calling returns anything. I went a little bit faster there because hopefully you're seeing that you know, you take the, the kind of algorithm you use to do this is you take what you want to end up with and you slowly transform it into uh, reifiers based on reflection information. This is how you write code injection code. After we've declared, defined our vtable, then we're going to capture the vtable pointers. And this actually looks exactly the same as before. We have a constructor template, and we're going to allocate a copy and capture the vtable pointer. Last thing is forwarding calls. The code for this is kind of ugly and is mostly similar things. So I'm not going to step through it, but I'm going to flash it up for, for completeness sake. This is again, just going to forward calls through the V table so that we end up calling the correct function. And now instead of writing all of this code for, um, for writing our animal class, all we need to do is declare what our facade looks like and then alias our this type class for to the class we want. This is a huge cut down in code. I've got a cat here meowing at me. Okay, so we can actually do better than this though. We can uh, We can do better than this. We can, um, instead of just taking our facade as a template parameter and always uh, dynamically allocating, we could take the storage policy as a template parameter. So now, instead of just allocating all the time, we could use a uh, small buffer optimization or always use in-place storage or, or anything we want. We can make it configurable. Similarly, we can take the a v table policy as a parameter. And this allows us to configure the, the storage of the v table. So now if we want to, to tune things a bit, we can say that, uh, you know, we, we could just use the type class for an animal facade. And that might be the same thing as using remote storage and remote v table, which means we you know, always allocate the, um, the concrete type, the, the concrete object, and we always just store the vtable in some static memory and store a pointer to it. But if we want to do something different, then we could use uh, a small buffer optimization with 32 bytes and always use it and store all of the vtable internally to the object so that we're not having to do two jumps to get to uh, a member function. We just indirect once. Uh, if we wanted to get really fancy, we could even say to always store the uh, the object in place and we'd get a compiler error if uh, if it doesn't fit. And then we want to split the vtable. So if we have you know some functions which are called a lot more often than others, then we could store the common ones inside the object and we could store the um, ones which are not called as much externally. And you could do anything you want. You could make this as complex or simple as you want. And this actually gets rid of the, the requiring dynamic allocation problem because we can now use small buffer optimizations and in-place storage if we know more about our types. We don't have to just always allocate. And now we've solved um, all of those problems with inheritance. But we can actually go even further. We could, instead of just having to, you know, we're declaring a facade and then we're aliasing. And if we use meta classes, then it could look like this. And this is really, really powerful. I mean, it's, it's just a small difference from here, but it's essentially saying that we're, we're now building our type class as a real um, abstraction as a library, which we can now use from our code. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about meta classes now. So meta classes are uh, a 
proposed extension to C++, and here's a description from the paper. They let programmers write a new kind of efficient abstraction, a user-defined named subset of classes that share characteristics like user-defined rules, defaults, and generated functions, where generated functions is what we're using in, in our example. Coming back to our, our point class, uh, you know, this just has X and Y members, but it does, we can't compare it, we can't um, do orderings on it. It would be nice if we could just, you know, say that I want to do lexicographical um, comparisons on this. I want to be able to treat this just like a, a value. And you could do this with something like a value meta class. And what this would do is um, inject all of the necessary code into uh, into the point class. This is a meta class definition. It's just a const eval function which takes some reflection information and does some injections. Now you could go and read the whole meta classes paper, and you should. It's got a lot of great um, examples and and things like that, but the now that we've introduced reflection and code injection, we can actually define it on one slide. If we have a point class which uses the value meta class, then this is the same as just taking the implementation of point, copying that into some hidden namespace and some like unnamed type, and then defining our point class by calling the value meta class on its reflection. I'll leave this up because it's, you know, it's a little bit weird to get your head around, but this is the entirety of the meta class's proposal in one slide, mostly. It's, it's really quite powerful. And you, know, like I said earlier, it's, it's a small change from our code injection version but it's really making us able to write our own abstractions and embed them right into the language. Uh, so we used our, we had our type class meta class and that would be the same kind of thing. It would be a, a compile time function which takes some reflection and it would inject all of the, the similar code which we had for our type class for. And then all we need is class type class animal or any name you want and then any number of member function declarations and now we can create a vector we can store anything which corresponds to this uh, interface in this vector we have full value semantics we are only dynamically allocating if we you know don't care or haven't tuned it yet or don't know anything about the sizes of our objects so this is really powerful and uh, concise, understandable, maintainable, solves a lot of problems with inheritance, but it does have some, there are some concerns about this as well. Uh, one concern is runtime performance. Um, I ran some, did some tests, you know, this is all available on Compiler Explorer. There's an experimental compiler. So I did a few, uh, few tests and sometimes everything can get in line. The compiler sees through everything. Uh, not all the time though. So if you're doing something a little bit more complicated, you might actually get better performance from virtual functions on some compilers because especially compilers like GCC have been doing a huge amount of work on devirtualization and, uh, and that really shows sometimes. I think in the future this would get better. You know, is if this kind of paradigm caught on, compilers would get better at optimizing through uh, function pointers rather than um, than relying on devirtualization. Um, so again, it's that kind of thing. Benchmark, talk to your compiler vendors, uh, file bugs if there's things which should be optimized but aren't. Compile time performance is 
is a concern and uh, it's not something I want to benchmark right now because the experimental compiler is all just trying to have a proof of concept and is is not optimized for compile time yet. Uh, I don't even want to give you a ballpark figure on that, but when as we uh, spend more time on meta classes, code injection, uh, compile time performance is something we should be thinking about, you know, especially for industries which need very, very fast iteration times like video games. We can't be affording to murder compile time performance in order to get uh, things which we could build by hand in an, a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so yeah, this is something which we need to be keeping in mind a lot as we move forward. I don't want to lose out on compile time performance just for the niceties which we have here. A more kind of um, philosophical concern which which I have is that this is essentially a, a different and incompatible way of specifying concepts. You know, our, our facade was essentially a concept. It was saying we have some interface and anything can can fulfill this interface and we're going to be matching these things at compile time and it's essentially just concepts but instead of working on usage patterns we're working on signatures so this could end up with a bifurcation where you know maybe you want to say you, you want to have a concept which works at compile time and at runtime you, you want to be able to say i have a, a template and i take anything which which uh fulfills this interface but then you will also want to say oh i want to store a vector of these objects right now you would have to specify the compile time concept and the runtime concept in different ways and that feels really wrong uh, there are some papers on uh, virtual concepts there's maybe some people looking at how we could do uh, reflection over concepts but I don't know where that's going to go and I'm not sure what the best approach there is so I'd love to hear more thoughts on on this point as far as future work goes there is a paper called PFA which really like, lays down a lot of these concepts and has a, um, a proposed interface for exactly what I'm I'm showing here. I'm actually working on a an implementation of this paper based on the the Met classes compiler at the moment. Here's some links. All of the code for this talk is on um, on Compiler Explorer. You can grab it, play about, see what the compiler's output. I have a kind of different style prototype implementation, which is on, on GitHub. It uses a, a different uh, way of implementing things. Uh, and it's maybe a bit better commented than the, the one on, on Compiler Explorer. But have a look at both, see what the different approaches are. The experimental compiler is developed by Lock3. Um, Andrew Sutton and Wyatt Childers are the, the main devs on that, I think. And uh, they're doing a really good job I, as part of writing this and some other things I've sent them bug after bug and they're always always knocking them out so please check that out uh, send them bugs send them PRs I'm sure they would appreciate that you can check out the the compiler on compiler explorer at cppx.godbolt and here's a couple of links to the some of the papers which I described as well and now we'll move on to questions thank you very much Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on to the Q&A section. Uh, I've got a few questions noted down um, already from the chat, but please keep sending them and it helps me if you prefix it with, with Q&A so I know what to look for. Uh, before I answer these, one thing I want to highlight is um, David Vandevoord, um, who works on EDG uh, and has written a bunch of um, standards papers in this, has commented in the, the chat that actually 
uh, his implementation is seeing maybe better compile times um, compared to existing um, things like uh, you know template instantiations cost a lot in compile time, and um, and so having these new facilities is actually improving compile times in in their implementations. So that's that's really really good to hear. Um, so one of the questions here is how does reflection and code injection relate to uh, the circle compiler? Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, circle is a, um, a kind of extension of C++, which is written by um, Sean Baxter. Um, he w was on CPP cast um, a while back, I think. Um, I would definitely recommend uh, having a look at Circle, it's a really, really interesting approach. Uh, and um, he has actually implemented a lot of these uh, these ideas as well. When I originally uh, released my, my type classes library, uh, Sean went away and added functionality to Circle, which does very, very similar things. So go ahead and look at that. Um, I have not actually played with Circle nearly as much as I maybe should have. Um, there is a paper written by um, the implementers of the um, the experimental Clang compiler um, about the circle meta model as a C++ standards paper, which you can go have a look at. Um, that might give you some, some better ideas. Um, and a question here. Do the, do the papers include some debugging for these new reflection tools? Um, yes, yeah, so this is a, a point which is, has come up a few times in, in the chat, debuggability. This is not something that I have put a lot of, um, of thought into right now. Um, there's definitely, the, the people who are writing these, um, these papers are, that this is a consideration, you know, how do we debug these things? Can you uh, set a, a breakpoint somewhere and uh, not just end up in some nonsense which is generated by your compiler. Like, how do you even get the debug information for that stuff? There's, um, yeah, there's a lot of additional considerations there, which I don't think we're at a, um, an endpoint of those yet. Uh, but if you have any thoughts on those, definitely get in touch with either myself or the, um, the implementers of, of the compiler or the people writing the papers. Um, a similar question was um, sometimes like, you know, if you have a macro, you might want to run the macro preprocessor to see what's generated. Can you do the same kind of thing uh, with this? Um, the compiler I've been using does have limited functionality for that. Uh, you can uh, say, print out the definition which you generated uh, from this meta function and um, and that will give you something. Uh, it's There's definitely a lot more which can be done there, but uh, yeah, I think that's definitely something which, um, which we need in this tooling. And the, the, uh, the question included a follow-up over whether this could be called on the command line and you could use it as an external tool. I think that would be really interesting. Uh, certainly when I was implementing all of the like all of the code for this talk in my library um i had to do a whole lot of trying to work out what was being generated where was i going wrong what silly mistakes was i making so there's there's definitely a lot of work which can be done in uh in tooling for this another question could you imagine these meta classes used in forward declarations jeez um I don't have an answer for that, I'm afraid. I'll have to, to think about that one. Um, may, maybe Herb has an answer to that since um, since he's now in chat. Uh, another one. Do you think med classes have a reasonable chance of making it into any upcoming C++ standard? Again, okay, I, I, I don't want to answer that one either. Maybe, maybe Herb can take that. Uh, I, I would love it if we got something like this. It's uh, I think it's really powerful. Um, it can really do a lot for the abstraction capabilities of C++, but I, I don't want to speculate on if or when it would uh, would make it into the standard. 
someone is curious about custom diagnostics for injected code. Will there be options for building error messages from type info or use in static assert? Yeah, that's a good question. So the um, the the current paper includes the ability to to make your own compiler errors. The the API is kind of limited, but uh, it gives you some um, some capabilities to to generate compile time errors based on um, compile time strings. So uh, yeah, that's definitely something which, you know, like because this is an abstraction capability, you want your error messages to appear at the level of your abstraction rather than the level of the uh, the generated code. So um, yeah, that's definitely something which uh, is being thought about and there's, there's already a uh, limited API for it. Another question, does reflection or code injection apply well in embedded systems? Absolutely. Um, I think that's a, a really, really fantastic place for it because uh, you can, like if, if you look at something like the Kvasir, um framework, which is a, a template metaprogramming framework for embedded systems, uh, this slots right in there. Like you generating code at compile time so you have more um, control over uh, like you're not having to have big tables kicking about at runtime and things like that um, yeah I think it's it's definitely really uh, applicable for uh, for embedded systems am I aware of any arm cross compilers that implement meta classes I mean the the compiler I've been using is clang based so uh, maybe in theory it can generate code for ARM. Uh, I haven't tried it. Uh, if you want to give it a shot, let me know how it goes. Uh, how much of the reflection code you used could be made into a widely usable library? Um, I mean, if you go look at my, my code, it's fairly decently commented. You could rip parts of it out. You could um, reuse it. You can do whatever you want with it. It's um, the, part of the power of this is we're implementing like language level abstractions as libraries. So um, yeah, definitely a lot of this code can be ripped out, reused. Could the next conference be an Animal Crossing? I would love that. Also, if anyone has good turnip prices on Animal Crossing, please let me know. I've got like 10,000 turnips. Uh, still got a few more minutes. Can you store animals with different storage policies on a single container? Uh, for that, you would need to uh, essentially erase your storage. Uh, you, you would need to use like some kind of polymorphic storage, um, which would have, um, you know, performance impacts. Uh, sure, you could you could do it. Um, but you would need to, yeah, it would, it would cost you. Uh, now the question, should the storage policy be part of the wrapper type or should the policy, storage policy always be SBO? Um, okay. So this is a similar question on specifying the, where do you specify the storage policy? I mean, this is how I implemented it. The storage policy was, uh, a template parameter on the, the type class for, or it could be a template parameter on the meta class. Um, you could do it in different ways. You could um, hard code it. You could make a template parameter of um, something else. It's I, I implemented it one way. You could do it however you like. Uh, Stood variant also typically uses tables of function pointers. Do I think it makes sense to have a meta class that injects method calls to std variant instead of requiring people to std visit? Um, I'm my brain is currently not working, so I can't envisage it. But off the top of my head, like anything which stops us using std visit is good because the code gen for that is generally awful. Um, so if we have a, I mean that. This is kind of like a std variant, but with a, a strictly, um, you know, we're, we're writing the interface we want our variant to to have. Um, 
but the the difference is this is an open set of types which you can store rather than a closed set which a variant has. Um, I would need to think about that some more. Um, but yeah, you could certainly use meta classes for doing something like this. Uh, I have time for one more question if anyone has one. I'm also on a very slight delay, so I see your questions uh, a little bit after. Okay, I'm going to call it there, and um, if you have any further questions, please uh, let me know. You can, as I said, um, oh, there's one more, is the ability to de-conflict naming of members and function signatures of using multiple inheritance. Um, so this is something which is addressed in the, um, the PFA paper which I linked. That one does think about um, using like multiple inheritance and, and conflicts. Um, I haven't thought about it as much as, as he has, so I would go read the paper. And last one, can you test if a type is part of a facade given your implementation? Sure, you could like inject some like some key which you then uh, have a meta function to check on. It would be pretty pretty simple. Okay, um, I'm gonna call it there. If you have any more questions, either um, you know send them to me on Twitter. I'm at Tartan Lama, um, or drop them in the chat. I'll still be around for the rest of the day. We're going to have a 30 minute break and then uh, Nick is going to be speaking to us about working from home on C++, which is um, probably relevant for a lot of us right now. Thank you very much.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, now I'm going to flip over to Nick Ullenhuth, who is going to be telling us how to optimize our C++ development while working from home. Uh, Nick works with me on the, uh, the Microsoft C++ uh, program manager team, and uh, he has a lot to share about you know, how do you actually do remote development with C++, especially at a time like this. So I'm going to flip over right now. Hello everyone and thanks for tuning into my talk for the Pure Virtual C++ conference. My name is Nick Ullenhut and I'm a program manager on the Visual Studio C++. Okay, the resolution is wrong on that. Just give me one second. I will fix this. We are very, very skilled in streaming in the, the Microsoft Visual C++ team. Here we go. Right back. And my focus is on making developers like yourselves more productive. You can follow my Twitter, which I've pasted on the slide, to stay up to date with some of the latest features that we're working on. But for this talk, I'll be focusing on what you can do to optimize your work from home productivity. Obviously, with the quarantine and COVID-19 situation, a lot of you are probably working remotely and realizing that there's a lot of things that we took for granted that are now becoming challenges. Specifically, I'll focus on three areas of challenges that we hear a lot, and I'll refer to those as the three C's. There's compute, collaboration, and communication. I'll dive deeper into each of these, but for now, compute is likely a new challenge for some of you since you may not have the luxury of working on a high horsepower desktop that you had at work. And now that you're at home, you might be working on an underpowered laptop. Next is collaboration. If you've been used to peer programming or joint debugging, then this remote work situation has probably greatly affected your ability to do this. And then the last of the three C's is communication. Apparently the icon that I have for this is something called a landline phone, but I'll be giving you some pointers of some tools that Microsoft offers to make your communication easier during these times. Now I know what some of you are probably thinking, Nick, there's another big challenge that we're facing now that we're working from home, and that's kids. Unfortunately, kids does not start with the letter C, so I can't give you any advice there, and I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide before someone tells me that children does start with C. So the first area is compute. If you're using a less powerful machine at home, you might be struggling with longer build times. And even if your build times aren't too bad, you might not have enough RAM on your machine, and so you're finding that your limited local resources are preventing you from doing a lot of work in parallel on your machine. Luckily, I'll be showing you a demo of ways that you can alleviate these problems. We'll take a look at how Visual Studio's Incredibuild integration can improve your build experience, and we'll also cover ways that Visual Studio Online can greatly enhance your work from home experience with its managed online development environments and by offloading your development compute to the cloud. With that, let's go ahead and dive into the first demo. All right, so I've opened up Visual Studio 2019 and I've opened up a project, VC Package. VC Package is Microsoft's C++ package manager, but what I'm using it for right now is just as a demo code base because it's an open source project on GitHub and I created a fork of it and I'm gonna be using it to show you ways that you can improve your build times. First, let's go ahead and just open up vcpackage.cpp. In this file, because I forked this project, I can actually see some of the edit history here. And I can see, for example, four different changes that were made from four different authors in the last few months. But what I really want to show is the Incredibuild extension, because again, I want to show you ways we can address the compute challenge now that you're working from home. So the Incredibuild extension can be acquired through the Visual Studio installer, and I'm going to actually run an entire rebuild of the whole solution to demonstrate some of the power of Incredibuild. Incredibuild offers a free tier license in this extension, which allows you to get advantage of this build monitor and parallelize your build on up to eight cores. So you can see I have these eight different Incredibuild agents that are all working to build my project and accelerate my build. What's great about the build monitor is that it allows me to see bottlenecks in my build processes and see how parallel parallelizable my build is and see which tasks are taking longer than others. 
You can actually take Incredible to the next level if you up upgrade your license and install the Incredible agent on even more machines. So for example, you can install the Incredible agent on other machines on your local network. And so then you can actually distribute your build among all those different machines or even take it to an even further level and put the Incredible agent in Azure machines and use unlimited cores and distribute your build as much as possible. But again, I'm just showing you the free tier in this demo. And so everything's just happening on my local computer. So you can see my CPU is at 100% right now. Uh, I'm running a, a build right now. I have the recording software and other, a few other programs running on my machine. And so I'm actually using quite a bit of RAM as well. And what I want to show you next is Visual Studio Online because it'll show you how we can actually offload a lot of that development inner loop compute to the cloud in order to free up my local resources. So it looks like this incredible build has finished. I have the done indicator here. So now let's go ahead and switch over to see how Visual Studio Online can help free up some of these local resources. I just showed you how I connected to a fork that I made of the VC package open source project with Visual Studio on my local machine. But now I wanna show you how I can connect to that same fork of the project but in Visual Studio Online. So what I have here is Visual Studio 2019, and you're probably used to this menu by now, but there's actually a new tab I wanna call out, and that's Connect to Environments. And this allows me to connect to Visual Studio Online. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, and it's loading up my plan right now. And this plan is the billable entity that I'll be working with, and associated with this plan, I already have three different environments. So I'm gonna be connecting to the VC package environment that I've created. But before I do that, I just want to quickly show you how I made it. All you have to do is click new, give it a name, I'll call it VC package two, and then paste in whatever repo you want to work out of. So this is, this happens to be the fork of VC package that I created. And then you can specify a SKU. So this is how much power you want your online environment to have. In this case, I've chosen an eight core, 16 gigabyte RAM machine. But if you don't think you need that much power, you could always scale down. And later, if you decide that you want more power, you can always adjust that. And I'll show you how to do that later. The last setting and the only other thing you need before you can create is to just specify what sort of timeout period you want. So you can say, after two hours of being idle, I want my environment to suspend. And this allows you to follow a pay for what you use model. So by saying two hours, my environment will be up and running for a long amount of time and I can reconnect quickly. But if I choose something like five minutes, that means after five minutes, my environment will suspend. And then when I go to reconnect, I will have to pay the price of a little, having to wait a little bit longer for that environment to start all the way back up. But with that, I could just click create here. But again, I've already created that environment. So I'll go ahead and just connect to my existing one. So this starts up Visual Studio 2019 as you would typically see it, and you've probably already very used to this UI. But one thing I want to call out is it's connecting to my Visual Studio online environment, and my local machine is only responsible for rendering this UI. All of the other tasks, all these other compute tasks, like populating my solution explorer, the language services, when I go ahead and build later, all of those tasks are being done in my online environment. So my local resources are really freed up. And so that allows me to take advantage of offloading that work in order to do other things while I'm in my development inner loop. So one thing to call out is this terminal. And this is my, my terminal view into my online environment. You can see it has the F drive right now. And that's associated with my online environment, not my local machine. So I can go ahead and type dir and maybe uh, I'll CD into my actual project here. And in here we can see that I actually have the same structure that I see over in my solution explorer. So the same stuff here is actually populated over in the tool source folder here. So this is my view into my online environment. But again, I obviously also have the solution explorer populated here. And I can click these projects and they get rendered immediately in my view pane here in my Visual Studio client. But I am connected to that online environment. So what I want to show now is building this project. And to sort of demonstrate the power of this, I'll go ahead and 
rebuild actually the entire project. And while that's happening, I'll open up this same CPU monitor that I showed before. You'll remember when I built this locally on my eight cores, my CPU was all the way at 100%. But this build is happening right now and I'm hovering around 30, 40%. So I have a lot of extra space, memory at 55. I've got a whole lot of CPU power to do any other task while I'm running this build. So that allows me to use these limited local resources a lot more efficiently. And the build actually already succeeded and it was, went by very quickly, so that's awesome. Now I could start a debug session connected to Visual Studio Online with this project, but I wanna briefly switch to another project to show you how to debug. I've jumped on over into this project called 2048, which is a console-based implementation of the game 2048, which is super fun. But I just want to show you the debugging because it's got some interesting debug output. So I'll go ahead and start the session. And again, I'm connected to Visual Studio Online, as you can see up in the top here. But what's super cool is that in this debug session, let me go ahead and click continue. It renders my console UI from my online environment into my local machine through live share app casting. So this live share title up here lets me know that this is being app casted. And I can actually interact with this. I can go ahead and start playing the game with my WASD keys. And that starts moving these numbers all around and I can start playing the game. But I can play that game for way too long, so I don't wanna bore you with that, but I also just quickly want to show you still have access to these auto local watch windows and a lot of your debugging tooling while connected to the Visual Studio online environment. So I'll stop the debug session. And now I'll switch over to the browser. So in this browser, I'm on online.visualstudio.com and we can see the same three environments from my Visual Studio online plan that we saw when I had connected from the Visual Studio client. So now we're basically just using the browser as a client to interface with Visual Studio Online. And this obviously opens up a whole lot of doors because now I can access my online environment anywhere I want as long as I have a browser. And this is also where I can change my instance type to a different amount of cores or RAM and where I can change my suspension timeout just by clicking on change settings. But what I want to show is actually connecting to one of these environments. So I'll connect to this VC package environment that we've been connecting to throughout. So in the browser, everything's being rendered here. I don't have any of the source code locally or anything like that. It's all coming from my online environment. And we can see my source tree has been populated here. And I can go ahead and click on one of these files. And I open it up right in my browser. It has all the semantic colorization that I would want and I can even right click on something and go to definition and that all works just fine. But again, this is all in the browser and I'm connected to Visual Studio Online, so it's super powerful. If you're used to VS Code, then this UI and this layout is probably very familiar to you. Um, and one thing I wanna show is down at the bottom, I have this CMake Tools extension, so I can actually go ahead and run a build from my browser. Now I already have, so that's why it's telling me that there's no work to do. But we can also go ahead and debug here. And now we're getting the same debug output that we would get as if we were debugging on Visual Studio, except now we see this output in our debug console here in the browser for VC package. So this is a super powerful tool, an easy way to connect to your environment. So if you even share your online environment with someone else, they can connect to it with their browser and it get, opens up a lot of flexibility there. Whew. Okay, so let's take a second to recap the two demos that we just saw. First, we looked at Incredibuild integration in Visual Studio via the extension. You can get the extension in the Visual Studio installer, and it gives you build acceleration on up to eight cores and access to their build monitor, which lets you diagnose bottlenecks and which build tasks are taking the longest. We also saw Visual Studio Online and saw the power of these online development environments. We're able to offload a lot of our inner loop dev tasks to the cloud. And because Visual Studio environments are online, we can access them from anywhere, whether it's from the web, Visual Studio code, or Visual Studio. Lastly, these online environments allow for easy onboarding. So once you've created this online environment, you can share it with a new hire, for example, so they can get off and running quickly and start contributing to your code base, even if they're working remotely. 
The last thing I wanted to bring up is Azure credits. Probably with your Visual Studio subscription, you get access to monthly Azure credits that you can use for individual usage. And I wanted to point out that you can use these to test out Visual Studio online, so I encourage you to do so and let us know what you think. So that covers the compute challenge area. The next up is collaboration. What Microsoft offers there is live share, and that allows you to tackle things like pair programming and joint debugging, among other things that you might find to be challenging during this remote work era that we're in right now. So let's go ahead and dive into a demo of live share and see how we can use it to improve our collaboration now that everyone's working from home. Once again, I'm in Visual Studio 2019. For those of you who don't know what live share is, Essentially, it's a way to allow multiple people to work on the same code base at the same time. To enable this, there's a host who has the source code and the language services, and then there's at least one guest who doesn't need to have any source code or any language services locally. They get all of that from the host. And the host and the guest can be any combination of Visual Studio, VS Code, uh, vice versa. And so it gives you a lot of flexibility on how you can set up these collaboration sessions. For the purposes of this demo, I'm going to be using a Visual Studio host, and I'll also be using a Visual Studio guest. To start a live share session, all you need to do as the host is click on the live share button in Visual Studio. And what this is doing now is generating a shareable invitation link for guests to join my session. So now over on the guest side, you can just say file, join live share session, paste in that link, and click join. Now the guest has joined the collaboration session, and on the host side, I can see who has joined the session. As the guest, I'm able to do any sort of edits to this file, and the host can see them happening on their side as well. But now let's say I scroll maybe a little bit further down in this file, and I start highlighting some things to show the host. Well, over on the host side, I have no clue where you are, and so I wanna show you that if I just click on this button, I can follow this guest, and now anywhere that that guest goes, I'll be following, so I can see where they are editing my file as we pair program. Even if they jump to another file, for example, game input, the host also jumped into that file as well. So we've seen a little taste of the power of live share for pair programming and how you can make edits and navigate through the file completely independently of what the host and the guest are doing, or you can follow them around. But another really cool feature of Live Share is the joint debugging capabilities. So when I start this debugging session, here you can see it spawned up this console app game. And my guest is in a debug session with me. And now what has popped up is a Live Share app casted version of the app onto the guest machine. So the guest can now see everything that the host is seeing as they debug their app. It gets casted over to the guest device, as we can see live share at the top and this is a live debug session but I can debug or I can play that game for a long time so I'm gonna go ahead and end the debugging session and it ends it on both the host and the guest all right so we saw how we could connect with a Visual Studio guest to this Visual Studio host but now I want to show you one last new feature of live share this allows you to just paste that shareable live share link into a browser and then that person can either join with Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio if they have it on their machine. But if they don't, they can actually join the live share session from the browser. So this is a super handy tool if, for example, you're doing remote candidate interviews for your company. So I'll go ahead and sign in so that I have the ability to edit. And I don't need a, a Visual Studio account. I can just use my GitHub account or a Microsoft account. And so now I should be good to go and I can actually edit this uh, workspace that the host has shared. And again, the host gets notified once I've joined, even from the browser. And so now in this browser, I have full access to this source tree and I can open up files and I can go ahead and make any sort of edits that I want to this file as I do, for example, a coding interview for your company. So it's a super powerful tool. I'm now able to actually connect from the browser to a live share session. And again, I can follow around as the host wherever the guest goes. So this can be really handy for you, not only for candidate interviews, 
But even if you're maybe on the go and one of your coworkers needs help, as long as you have a browser, you should be able to join their live share session and help them out. Okay, so we saw a lot of the power share and how it can be used for pair programming, joint debugging, or even conducting remote coding interviews. It's on by default in Visual Studio, but you can also get it as an extension for VS Code if you prefer to use VS Code. And then lastly, I also showed you how to connect from the web so you can share that live share invitation link with anyone. And as long as they have a browser, they should be able to connect to your session. Lastly, app casting is a great way to do these joint debugging sessions so the guests can see exactly what you're seeing on your app as you're debugging. And the final part I wanted to bring up about live share is the insiders capability. So in Visual Studio and VS Code, I have a screenshot for both on the right. You can actually choose to be a part of the insider feature set so you can be exposed to the latest and greatest improvements in live share. And that takes me to the next slide because one of the insider features is audio calling. And so if you want to do that within live share, definitely sign up for insiders. But speaking of audio calls and communication, that's the last challenge area that I want to cover. And it's hard to talk about communication without bringing up Microsoft Teams, which allows you to do video conferencing on the web or the desktop app. And it's part of Office 365. So if you already have an Office 365 subscription, you should be able to have access to Microsoft Teams. But what I really wanted to bring up here is that because of this uh, COVID-19 situation, Microsoft actually has decided to make Microsoft Teams free right now. And so you can go to aka.ms slash customer commitment to learn more about our COVID-19 customer commitment and how we're off, how you can get Teams for free during this time. All right. Speaking of updates, here's my final slide. Uh, just some links so you can stay up to date with the latest and greatest that our team is working on. I encourage you to download the latest Visual Studio preview, which you can do at the link here. And again, you can probably just do a screenshot of this page and save these links. But you can also visit our blog, and we blog all the time about new features that we're rolling out. And you can leave comments on the blog, give us suggestions, things like that. Uh, I also encourage you to join us for the Microsoft Build Conference, which is also going to be an online virtual conference. So the good news about that is that there is a much lower barrier to entry. You don't have to travel, so definitely encourage you to go there. We have Our C++ team has quite a few talks. And lastly, follow our team at Visual C on Twitter, and you can follow me as well. Uh, to stay up to date with our productivity features. Thank you so much, and I hope you all have a great rest of the conference. Okay, thank you very much. We're now gonna switch over to a uh, live Q&A with Nick. Nick, welcome. You are now live. Okay. All right. It seems like uh, my stream might be a little bit lag behind, so I'll try not to look. <laughs> yeah, don't look at the live stream while you're doing the Q and A. That will not go well. Okay. So some questions. Uh, some of these you've already answered in chat, but um, we'll we'll capture them as well. So. One question, is it possible to connect a private or proprietary repo to an online environment? We do support repos right now connect to the environment. Credentials are streamed. Oh, wait, let me actually mute the stream. Sorry. OK. So right now, you're, uh, when you connect to the remote environment, the credentials are streamed to the remote. And it can act on your behalf as if it were a local. So if you can access a git command line, then you can access uh, from your online environment. And I also want to talk about one other thing related to Visual Studio Online. Someone asked if uh, like GUI desktop apps supported. Right now, for Visual Studio support for Visual Studio Online, we support um, console apps and library. And Oh, sorry. I thought my screen was frozen. Sorry. Ooh. So right now we support console and library apps. Um, we are looking to expand these workloads more and more. And 
like Ural's feedback that we continue to get is going to help us prioritize those workloads. Um, but eventually, yes, we want to be able to support um, GUI applications and desktop apps and uh, the other C++ workloads. Just that now we're taking a very um, like a uh, very dialed approach where we're going waves and approaching each workload sort of one by one, and onboarding all that functionality. Sorry, yeah, I will mute when I'm not talking so I don't pick up echoes, apologies. Um, okay, the next question is, I tried live share once, but failed to see what the advantage was compared to screen sharing. Yeah, uh, so I answered this one in the chat, but I can expand on that a bit more. So one advantage is if I'm screen sharing someone, then they either have to look at exactly what I'm sharing, or if I'm giving them control, then I'm giving up to them, whereas live share allows the host and any number of guests to act independently of each other. So you don't have to be tied down to having uh, the user do everything in, in the driving seat. You can act independently. And so I can be editing one file while my teammate is editing a completely other different file in my repo. And uh, someone else mentioned a few images that they found in the chat as far as like speeds and things like that. I'm still hearing a bit of an echo, but. Okay. Okay, the next question is, um, can you switch easily between um, versions or how does the BS Online handle toolchain versioning? Uh, sorry, what was the question? I missed it. How does um, BS Online handle toolchain versioning? So ideally, what will happen is in your repo or in some sort of file that we can specify what tools you need, you'll be able to specify everything, all the different configurations and, and tooling that you'll need in something like maybe like a dev container.json or something like that. And it'll install all those configurations and dependencies for you. Right now, it's set up in a way where we already have a lot of the common tooling installed, but we eventually want you to be able to specify exactly what you'll need, and then it'll the environment will automatically configure that for you. So you should be able to say what tool set and things like that that you're using. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. OK, I think we've got time for um, a couple more questions, if anyone here has any. Okay, so someone asked, will this work with mixed mode debugging? Uh, I haven't tested it with that yet, but that is something that we would eventually hope to support. So if you are testing it out, which I hope you all do test out Visual Studio Online, uh, right now you can you can use like the Azure credits, like I was saying in my talk, to test it out with Visual Studio Code that currently is supported. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely something that we want to uh, look into. Man, I keep hearing X throwing me off. <laughs> Sorry. And then one more is the live service ITAR compliant. Uh, I actually don't know how to answer that question. So I'll uh, maybe defer that to someone else or get back to you later. All right, I think that's um, us for now. We will now uh, switch over to the next talk by Erica in just a, a minute.
Okay, everyone, we're going to switch over next to a talk by Erica Sweet. Um, it's going to be on C++ cross-platform development with Visual Studio and WSL. Uh, so hopefully this will have some content for people who are uh, you know, develop doing the development on Windows, but you know, you want to test your applications on Linux as well. How do you actually do that in a productive manner? Uh, and we will find out in this talk. Hey everyone, my name is Erica. I work on Microsoft's Visual C++ team, and today I'm going to be chatting with you all about C++ cross-platform development with Visual Studio and the Windows subsystem for Linux. So I'm going to start by defining what we mean when we say native support for WSL and Visual Studio. I'm then going to introduce our CMake support in Visual Studio, and then the bulk of my time is going to be spent in a demo where I configure a CMake project to build and debug both locally on Windows and on the Windows subsystem for Linux. And then at the end, I'm going to quickly cover our WSL2 story. So since Visual Studio 2017, we've had support for building and debugging C++ projects uh, on remote systems over SSH. In Visual Studio 2019, we added native support for WSL. And WSL, or the Windows subsystem for Linux, if you haven't used it, lets developers run a Linux environment directly on Windows. Now, when we say our native support, what we mean is that instead of invoking commands on WSL as if it were a remote system over SSH, all commands are executed locally. This means there's just one single copy of your source tree and no need for Visual Studio to manage file copying or maintain two synchronous copies of your build tree, one on Windows and one on your Linux system. This leads to no dependency on SSH as well as performance improvements. If you're using Visual Studio 2019 version 16.4 or later, you can also leverage the integrated terminal to interact directly with WSL from Visual Studio. CMake is a cross-platform open source meta build system, and it's really popular among C++ developers, especially among those who are doing cross-platform development. It is our recommendation for anything cross-platform or with an eye to open sourcing. CMake support in Visual Studio means that you can open any folder containing a CMake list.txt file and edit it, build it, and debug it locally on Windows, on a remote system, or on WSL without ever generating Visual Studio project and solution files. You can still leverage almost the same full suite of IntelliSense, code navigation, and debugging features that you might be used to when working with uh, Windows-based solutions, as well as some CMake-specific features that will make it easier for you to make sense of, edit, and author your own CMake scripts in Visual Studio. And all of this stuff I'm going to be showing and talking about more as a part of my demo. So with that, I'm just gonna hop in um, here I have a CMake project open in Visual Studio. It looks and behaves very similarly to a normal Visual Studio solution with a few key differences. The CMake settings editor is where you can specify what system CMake will be invoked on and where you'll be building. So again, that can be locally on Windows, that can be on a remote system connected over SSH, or that can be natively on WSL. So right now I'm building on WSL using the GCC toolset. The CMake settings editor is also where you can specify things like configuration type, any CMake variables or environment variables, and pick your compilers. The CMake settings editor is just an overlay on top of the CMake settings.json file, which can be checked in and shared between team members so that all of your project specific CMake configuration only needs to be done once. The project that I'm working with right now is just a calculator that takes in any number of postfix expressions and evaluates them. So I'll go ahead and run it and show you how it works. Um, note that because I'm building and running on WSL, whenever I start debugging, it's using the front end, the Visual Studio Debugger backed by GDB. 
So here I have the Linux console window, which is a way for me to interact directly with my applications running on WSL or on a remote system from Visual Studio. It's interactive, so I can give it some input. I'll read in an expression, x equals 2, read in another expression, x plus x, and then evaluate the second expression, or in this case, x plus x. And it looks like I've hit an address sanitizer error. So address sanitizer is a runtime memory error detector for C and C++ that used to be native to Linux and Mac that we have integrated directly with the Linux workload in Visual Studio. So that address sanitizer errors will surface in the IDE alongside your code whenever you are debugging on WSL or on a remote system. And I say used to because we actually recently ported ASAN over to be used on Windows with the MSVC toolset as well. But it looks like I have a heat buffer overflow issue here. Um, so I'll dig around and see if I can see what's happening. So I'll jump over to the call stack and start stepping through. And here it looks like I have an array of expressions with two elements but we're trying to access the second element and it's index at zero, so that's out of bounds. So I wanna see if I can find where this M expression number is being set. So I will find all references. And it looks like these results returned at the top is where it's actually being set. So I'm gonna to jump to about, yeah, line 80, 90-ish. <clears throat> And yeah, here it looks like we're reading in all of the expressions, but then we're setting expression number equal to red number. And for a better user experience, this should probably be red number minus one. So that, for example, if the user wants to evaluate their second expression, we're accessing the first element of the array. So I'll change that here and here, save the file. And then I'm also gonna hop back over here and set a breakpoint where this is actually being evaluated so I can make sure it's behaving as I want. Um, I just set a normal breakpoint, but when you're debugging on um, WSL or a remote system with Visual Studio, you still have the full suite of debugging features available to you. So I could still make this, you know, a conditional breakpoint or a trace point, which doesn't halt code execution. And with that, I will restart the debugger. All right, <clears throat> back to my Linux console window. I'll just feed it the exact same input. So I'll read in x equals two, read in x plus x, evaluate the second expression, and this time the array still has two elements, but we are accessing the first element, so that looks a lot better. When I continue execution, it looks like two plus two does indeed equal four this time, so that's behaving as expected. Um, the last debugging feature that I wanna show off to you guys is that you can interact directly with the underlying debugger, in this case GDB, and execute custom GDB commands. So if I hop on over to the command window, um, and I use the command debug.mi debug exec, uh, MI engine is the open source engine that we use to interface with GDB then I can execute any GDB command. So let's say that I want to view an assembler dump of this print post fix expression. Then if I pause the debugger, I can view that full assembler dump right in the command window. And hopefully this shows you that when you are debugging on WSL or a remote system with Visual Studio, you can still leverage the same suite of debugging features that you might be used to when using an IDE like Visual Studio. So a really visual way to navigate the call stack or set breakpoints, as well as us bringing native Linux tooling uh, to Visual Studio. So things like ASAN or the ability to execute custom GDB commands. So, so far I've been debugging, 
but now I want to add a logging library in case anyone else who's using this runs into issues that they want to send on over to me. So I'll go over to my CMake list, which is where I set dependencies on third-party libraries. And then I'm going to use the find package command. You can see that I'm getting IntelliSense suggestions and tooltips, and that's a part of the CMake and editor documentation that we added to surface, surface official CMake docs directly in the IDE. So I'm going to add glog, which is the logging library, and I'll add a config required. So I'll save that to regenerate the cache. And it looks like CMake is yelling at me because I don't actually have glog installed on WSL. But I'm getting this quick action to install glog using VC package. So I'll start that and then kind of walk you through what's happening. So if you haven't had it, haven't heard of it, VC package is a cross-platform command line tool that can be used to bring down, build, and install C and C++ libraries from source on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. So here you can see I'm installing the X x64 linux triplet of glog directly on wsl and all of the output is being routed to the output window so that i can keep an eye on it note that i only got this vc package quick action suggestion because i already had vc package installed on WSL, um, and I've included some links at the end of my deck that shows you how to get started with VC package if you don't already have it. Um, if I hover over the library here, I can see that there's two commands I need to include to consume this library, the find package command, which I just added, and then the target link libraries command. Um, I actually already have that as well, so I'm just going to add glog. I can see that I'm inheriting these default linker options, default compile options, and default project options. If I didn't actually know what these default options were, we've added language services to CMake scripts so I can do things like peak definition and see those default linker options enumerated for me. Note that this is pulling from a separate file in a completely different subdirectory. And this is really common when you're working with large CMake projects. They're oftentimes structured across multiple different subdirectories with a lot of different CMake lists.txt. And so hopefully this is a way, uh, a tool that can make it easier for you to make sense of, edit, and author your own CMake scripts in Visual Studio. So it looks like this has been done for a while. Um, it's telling me glog, installation of glog has succeeded, regenerate the CMake cache to detect the new package. That's why I've been getting this gold bar up here. So I can regenerate the cache and I should be good to go. Over here in the Solution Explorer, the layout of my files currently matches the layout of my files on disk. And that's fine for this project because it's pretty small. But if I was working with a larger project, there's something called CMake Targets View, which is a more CMake centric way of viewing your code organized by target that can help you to more easily make sense of um, really large projects with more complex structures. We've recently also added CMake Project Editing Support in Visual Studio, and so that uh, is Visual Studio's attempt to help you easily add, rename, and remove file and target references to existing projects in Visual Studio. So let's say that I want to add a new source file. Just call it source.cpp. Instead of just dropping that file on disk, Visual Studio will try to guess where you can add a reference to that new source file in your CMake script so that it's actually picked up. Um, this is what MS Build does automatically behind the scenes when you're working in VCXproj, but because there's a million different ways that you can author your own CMake scripts, Visual Studio will make its best guess. And if it has, uh, if there's mo any ambiguity, it'll suggest multiple different options as to where that reference can be added. And so you can view and preview them all and then only apply the changes that you wanna see. 
So, so far, even though CMake is cross-platform, cross I've only been building and debugging on WSL. So now I'm going to show you how easy it is to get started and retarget the same project for Windows. So I'll go back to the CMake settings editor, add a new configuration. This time it's going to be an x64 debug configuration. Um, there's nothing that I need to specify here, but again, this is where I can specify things like configuration type and my compilers. We have out-of-the-box support for both Clang CL and MSVC when you're targeting Windows. So let me make this my active configuration and then select the same executable just so I can show you that it's the same application running both on WSL and on Windows. So here's my calculator. I can read in an expression x equals 2, x plus x, evaluate the second expression. Here I'm hitting the same breakpoint that I had set earlier when I was debugging on Linux. So you can see it's the same source code, same everything. Oops. So I'll stop debugging. Um, in Visual Studio 2019 version 16.4, there was support added for an integrated terminal, and that can be used to uh, interface with the developer command prompt, with CMD, or with a local WSL installation. So here is my, oops. Here is my, um, local WSL installation, Ubuntu. It drops me right in my working directory, which you can see is the mounted C drive. So if I take a look at my file structure, I can again see that I only have um, one source directory, one root cmakelist.txt, one cmakesettings.json. So I'm using the same source code to target both Windows and WSL. If I CD into my build folder, then you can see I have two sets, one for my configuration that contains L5 and one for my X configuration that contains my Win executables. So two different executables can be generated from the same source code. Um, right now, I'm just using this integrated terminal to navigate the structure, but it can used, be used to run command line tool, whatever steps you normally need to take outside of Visual Studio um, directly from the command line. All right. All right, so another thing that we hear from cross-platform developers is that they oftentimes only build for one platform locally, and then they'll rely on their CI system to check build errors across their other target platforms where they've checked in. So a feature that will hopefully make it easier for you to check build errors across multiple platforms before checking in. So let's say that I add something um, or accidentally include something that is Windows specific, like including Windows.h. Then you can see I get these purple squishes basically telling me, hey, this is defined for your current active configuration, my x extraction, but it's not defined for your configurations in this case. Too. If I make my active configuration, those squishes should turn red because Windows is defined on Linux. But if I were to this in if def, so if def win 32, then you'll see all these squiggles go away and I'm back to having platform agnostic code. So hopefully this will let you make it easier for you to check build errors across multiple platforms before checking in, especially if you're you know, typically a Windows shop and you build for Windows, but then you also want to make sure that you compile on Linux. Adding a WSL configuration is a really quick and easy way to do that. All right, so the last feature I want to show you guys is something we call the separation of build and debug, and that's the ability to separate your build system from the system that you are deploying to. Systems so have to have the same architecture or instruction set. Um, the example I'm going to today is pretty simple. I'm going to keep my same build configuration, so I will continue building natively on WSL, but I'm going to deploy and debug a Linux Docker container so I'm locally and connected over SSA. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new um, I want launch Linux GDB to be debugged on a remote host. And this add a new CPGDB lit. Be very neat. Extremely deep on the debugging be on development system. This might be different than what you've seen with previous versions. Um, the only changes to make here is one, I'll add a more friendly name um, so I can identify configuration. 
I need to add project target, which in this case I can just add my calculator. So it needs to be one of your um, target in this dropdown. And I'll add room and name. So by default, the value of this key is synchronized with your build system, which is set in settings.json. So by default, when I'm debugging, I'm debugging where I'm building natively on WSL. Only when I want to separate these systems do I need to specify them. Um, and this will specify the machine that I am deploying to and debugging on. So I'll go ahead and select uh, my local host, which is my Linux Docker container running locally and I will save that. This launch.vs.json file is always well you, where you will configure debugging sessions uh, for CMake projects in Visual Studio. So let me just pull up that Docker container real quick. Um, if I list the running processes, you can see that my only processes are SSH and bash. But when I select my custom debug configuration and start debugging, what's Happening is that I am continuing to build locally on WSL, but I will be deploying to and start debugging on my Linux Docker container. So from Visual Studio's point of view, this looks exactly the same. I still have my Linux console window here to interact with the application. But if I jump back to my Docker container, then you can see that GDB is running. and my calculator executable is running, and so I am debugging on this system. You can also see here in my build directory that only the binary folder has been copied over. There is no intermediate build output because the build is still happening locally on WSL and this is only the things I need to be able to debug. All right, so that kind of wraps up the demo session. Let me jump back to the slide deck. To quickly summarize, some things we talked about today are debugging features that let you leverage um, the full Visual Studio debugging experience with CMake projects when you're working on a remote system or WSL, as well as Linux-specific tooling like the Linux console window, Ace, or executing custom GDB commands. We covered cross-platform VC package integration for library acquisition. I only did this on WSL, but it works the same on Windows or on a remote system. We covered CMake language services and project editing that make it easier for you to make sense of, edit, and author your CMake scripts. We covered platform-specific IntelliSense, or those purple squiggles, which will hopefully make it easier for you to check um, for build errors across multiple platforms before checking in. And we covered the ability to separate the system that you are building on from the system that you are debugging to and deploying on. One last note that I want to make is that this whole demo was done with a CMake project, but the same exact feature set minus the CMake specific features are available with MS Build based Linux projects as well. And that can be an option for you if you're not really, if, if you're not writing cross platform code, like you're only building and debugging on Linux from Windows as your host operating system, or um, if you just don't want to use CMake. And then quickly, WSL2 works in Visual Studio, except you cannot yet use our native support if your source files are stored in the Linux root file system and the C++ team blog is where you should go for updates on that. 
that's it for my demo. Thank you guys. Um, the code base that I use is on GitHub if you want to play around with anything. C++ Team Blog is the place to go for all announcements. And then if you want to take a screenshot of this, this is some relevant documentation to get started with WSL or CMake support. Um, debugging or configuring your launch file to be debug in Visual Studio, that launch.bs.json file and VC package. Okay, thank you everyone. Sorry for the problems with the stream there. Um, we'll hopefully get it addressed. Um, we're going to attempt a live Q&A and see how it goes. Um, we just need a, a little sec to, to get set up, so um, I will be back in just a second. Okay, I think we should be good to go now. So I'm going to flip over. Um, please send your questions in chat. And here is Erica, who is joining us from Seattle. So we have our first question is, we heavily depend on Incredibuild for our code base. Does WSL have any way to use Incredibuild or anything comparable? Uh so Incredibuild is available only on Windows, but there are some build accelerators that you can use on uh, any Linux system. You can use with Remix support in Visual Studio, so like DCC or Ccash um, is something alternative that you could use when building on Linux. Well, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Or do you have anything else you'd like to share, Erica? Um, yeah, just I it was kind of happy for me too. So if it would be for other folks, um, I gave a similar talk. Well, this will be recorded or recorded, but I also gave a similar talk at WSL conference um, a few weeks ago. So you can check that out. The streams are live for that if you have gaps, um, or you can reach out to me with questions. Great, okay, we don't seem to have any other questions in chat, so um, I'll call it there. Thank you very much, Erica. All right, thanks. Okay, so our next session is gonna be in uh, half an hour. We're gonna be having jean hyde Manid talking about text encodings for C++. Uh, we'll see you there.
Hey everyone, welcome back. Sorry about the problems with the stream for the last talk. My kid was streaming Lilo and Stitch in HD, so that was probably the reason. Anyway, our next talk is uh, John Heath Mead with Lucky7, or uh, designing text encodings for C++. So if you've ever wondered how you would do text encoding and Unicode properly in C++, then hopefully you will find out in this talk. So here we go. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Heed Maneed, and I am a consultant, um, software developer uh, from Shepherd's Oasis. And the thing I'm here to talk to you about today is the fundamental underpinnings of a text encoding API that's being proposed for standardization in C++, but that I'm also kind of developing independently um, alongside Shepherd's Oasis, uh, and how that enable how that new API is going to enable us to really make some significant and powerful changes uh, to the way that we handle text in C++ in general. And so the previous work that we had was uh, both part one and part two. Part one was given at CppCon in 2019. Part two was done at Meeting C++ in 2019. Um, the part one gives a very broad overview of the entire design space and where we pulled inspiration from and who we were working with. And part two is more of a greater look into some very specific points of the APIs and how to make it scale, how to make it work with uh, you know, type erased encodings, right, so that we could support the use cases like that, um, and also how to uh, use things like error handling to allow yourself to do uh, more powerful things uh, in the API. But now we're going to talk about some of the basis operations because it's been asked a couple of times uh, what the basis operations are and how we should be handling them. So let's take a look into those. First, we're going to talk about some constraints. Uh, if you watched the previous talks, then some of these constraints are going to be uh, repetitive, but basically car is bad. Um, and car is bad for a lot of different things. Um, the first problem with car is that it has a fundamental issue with uh, what is its encoding is. Um, you don't necessarily know, right? Uh, the minute you interact with the system, the minute you interact with the C API, um, you don't really know whether or not you're actually getting a proper UTF-8 or, you know, some you know, Windows 1252 or some other thing. And so the real fundamental uh, uh, improvement that we want to make here is uh, trying to fix this problem of what is the encoding of stuff is, right? Because right now people don't know what the encoding is and they just kind of make assumptions and those assumptions break down a lot. Uh, we also know that WCRT is bad, and it's a real dead end, right? So it's UTF-16 on Windows, um, except when you use it with the standard library, in which case it will cut your surrogate pairs in half um, or ignore them entirely. Um, and so you'll end up with what's more closer to something like the 1990s UT UCS-2, which is, you know, where the only 16-bit was the maximum number of characters. So if you have more than 16 bits, they just kind of say, well, we don't need that. Um, and so it'll get mangled in it for today when you want to really actually be using UTF-16. Um, we have UTF-32 on policy machines, which is nice, um, except if it's an IBM uh, machine you're working on, uh, and then you get UTF-16 on a 32-bit machine, UTF-32 on 64-bit machines, and then you get none of the above if you're on uh, a Chinese or Japanese-based uh, locale on any of those machines. Um, so that's incredibly unfortunate, and it's just kind of the way the cookie, the cookie crumbles here. The other thing that's bad is CAR 16T and CAR 32T, um, particularly because there is a define in the C standard that says if uh, it's defined, if stood C UTF-16 or UTF-32 are defined, then it's UTF-16 or UTF-32, and otherwise, well, it's just one big shoulder shrug. What exactly is the encoding of CAR 16 CAR 32T? Uh, at that point, who knows? And there's no really way to query it or figure it out or get an answer. Um, you just kind of have to consult your documentation and pray that your uh, developer the developer of your compiler and your environment is a uh, jerk. Um, except not anymore. Um, thanks to some influential work done by uh, RMF, uh, we have now um, 
mandated that CAR 16T and CAR 32T will be UTF 16 and UTF 32. Uh, this goes for C++ 20 onward, but thankfully we didn't find any implementations, C++ implementations that uh, differed from this behavior. Um, and we kind of strongly implied it with the wording. So thankfully uh, we get the benefit that CAR 16T and CAR 32T uh, will be UTF 16 and UTF 32 from C++ 20 onward. Um, and you know, even if it's not, even if you're not working with CS plus 20, you still kind of get the semi de facto guarantee. We haven't found, again, we haven't found a compiler author who's done the wrong thing and like, you know, tried to fit some weird encoding in CAR 16T or CAR 32T. Um, but, uh, you know, there's always room for a special help plus plus implementation, right? So let's talk a little bit about uh, the general like API support, right? For C and CSS, what what does the the standard give you to, to kind of go from one thing to another encoding in a, in, a, in a way that works and doesn't break and isn't fragile? Uh, this slide is intentionally left blank. Why? Because uh, there is uh, there is no support. It's it's a it's a uh, garbage shoot. Um, everything about it uh, ends up in the dumpster. Every API designed is bad. Uh, for a wide variety of reasons, um, whether it's the locale-based codec VT stuff, um, or the uh, C APIs, which have real problems with outputting multiple different characters, and uh, had to have a defect report filed against some of the functions, but they're still not proper for other functions, and it's a mess, um, to lack of wide character support for getting in and out of the wide character encoding to uh, normal encoding. Um, it's basically a nightmare. Um, in every single aspect of C and C++, and that nightmare has infected the world because uh, every single low-level device or embedded device that's built on top of these small C APIs and small like C standard libraries that are shipped by vendors uh, very much uh, has left people in the dark. So you have cache registers and other devices that really just can't stand up to the their needs of their users. Um, it's a real shame. It also produces a lot of frustration. Um, you know, so I get emails semi-regularly about, uh, you know, specifically this commit, but also other things. Um, this this commit, you know, it's got some some uh, really bad ableist language in there, but, you know, it, it appropriately captures the frustration of locales and having locale-based encodings and the nightmare that it is of working with uh, C and, in, and by, by proxy C++. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot of things people want to do, right? Like, so, so people are like, well, well, we'll just fix it, right? And the first, the first thing people always say is like, car should just be UTF-8, right? Just, just, just make car UTF-8, right? Mandate that in the standard, get rid of all these locale encodings, right? Like, you know, nobody cares about all these old systems. Just, just make it UTF-8, just use UTF-8, just, just do it. Like, you know, just, just do it, right? You know, they, they do, they do this. Do it! Just do it! You know, so people at committee meetings, um, and everybody didn't fully read UTF-8 everywhere, right? They always come to me and like, where's the, U why isn't car UTF-8? Come on, like, you know, I can, you know, yes, cars, you know, the sign of car is completely implementation defined, right? So it could be signed or unsigned, but you know, I pass my compiler flag to, to the thing, right? And I get unsigned, you know, my cars are of unsigned type, right? So I can, you know, just use UTF-8 and know the math is correct and there's no bad overflow underflow and just does exactly what I want. So why don't we just do that? Um, and here's my hot take. Uh, we won't just do it. Uh, we'll, we actually just don't do that. And we can't do that for a lot of different reasons, right? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of problems with that, right? A lot of that is comes from like, oh, why does my string, gender string contain garbage, right? And that's because a lot of people try to run on this assumption that, oh yeah, UTF-8 is, 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 it's car. Car is totally UTF-8, right? They run with this assumption and they bring it all over their code base and then that happens when they use a C API or directly the environment and they just lose, right? Um, because that's just, it's that's not what it is. Um, using car for both the system encoding and UTF-8 is wrong. It's in flagrantly wrong, right? Um, and it's flagrantly wrong because it will always make the wrong choice. Um, at some point, somebody's gonna port some software, do some thing, and they're not gonna be thinking about UTF-8 or whatever else. They're just gonna be using strings and your code is going, and that code is going to be wrong uh, on that environment, right? So you have to really go with the assumption that car will never be UTF-8 always, right? And, you know, there's, you know, we hear about it in the committee and, and other proponents are like, excuse me, I can enforce it in my code, my, my pristine, beautiful code base that I can, you know, that I control completely, right? Um, and there's no way that it could possibly be 
anything but UTF-8, right? And that's what they say. And then uh, this happens. And they lose the game. And they always lose the game because they don't control the environment um, as much as they would love to. Uh, and so the, whether it's the Carstar ARGV or whether it's the uh, data that comes over the wire or whether it's the C API that just doesn't really care and just generates the data from whatever your locale-based encoding there is, um, you lose. You end up losing. Um, and there's really no way around this kind of fundamental fact that the environment already has been thoroughly poisoned by locale-based encodings, and there's really not much that we can do about it. Um, and you also have to remember that like, you're, not, you're not Google, you're not Bloomberg, you're not Facebook, you're not Microsoft, you're not, you're not some big tech company, right? I mean, some of you listening might be, but you don't own the entire tech stack, right? You don't own the user's locale. You can't tell them what to do with it, and you are the piece in a much bigger pie, right? So you can't just say, well, everything's going to be UTF-8, and that's just the way it's going to be, uh, because you don't, right, like when, when, when Google and Microsoft, if you're working global foundation services or whatever else, right, like they get a machine, right, they control it. The minute that machine gets hooked up to their racks and their data centers all the way out to the time that they, they send you something, right, like they control every single part of the stack, right? They have the operating system, everything else. Google, similar deal. Bloomberg, similar deal. Facebook, not exactly the same deal, but again, for, for server base, right, they can control everything, right? They can, you know, part of their spin up is that UTF-8 is applied as locale and et cetera, et cetera, and they verify this and it's checked, but you can't do that as the end user, right? And remember that the CSP standard is for everybody, right? Not just for the big tech companies. So you need to remember that you are part of a, a much bigger, that you are a piece of a much bigger pie. And please, please, please don't forget that, you know, for as much as you'd like to rage against the machine and say everything should be UTF-8, uh, please don't forget that you are a much bigger piece of pie, that you fit in with the legacy, and that not everybody can afford to uh, have your crazy, super awesome Kubernetes setup uh, and make everything wonderful. So um, now that we've got kind of past some of the constraints and the issues that we have, uh, let's talk about encoding objects, right, and, and, and how this would be useful. Um, so I've talked about this before, but I'm going to give a quick run through again of what an encoding object is. And basically it's at minimum a collection of three type definitions, code point, code unit, and state, two static member variables, which is just a number, an integer that's, you know, tells you the maximum number of code points and the maximum number of code units that can be output by a single operation. Then you have the two operations, the, 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 the single functions, right? So you have encode one, which can uh, take some code points and output some code units in the specified encoding or take some code units of that encoding and output, output some code points, you know, typically, you know, your Unicode UTF-32 code points in that encoding. And that's basically how that works. And that's it. Uh, this, this, is, this is the uh, hill that I'm going to die on. This is the uh, rung that I'm going to hang my hat on. Uh, this is where I'm going to put my code in. Um, this is all you need. Period, point blank. You only need those seven things. That's it. That's lucky seven. You're set that you can build literally everything on top of that. And now some of you are probably looking at me like, uh, pardon me? Is that true? Um, I'm going to show, I'm going I'm to prove it to you, right? I'm going to prove to you that that's all you need to do everything, right? So here's some supporting structures, right? So we have some struct, an, an empty structure, right? It's literally, it's literally just empty struct. It's got nothing in it. Just, it's just two, two, uh, two braces. Um, we've got a byte span, which is just a span of said byte, and a bunch of type defs, you know, for spans of various types. So you have C span, which is a car span, U8 span, which is a car ET span, U16 span, you know, car 16, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have an encoding error type, which, you know, can be encoding error okay, which is just, you know, everything's fine, which is zero because that's what APIs do. Um, invalid sequence, which means uh, you tried to encode something, uh, but it was just the bytes were wrong. Um, incomplete input, which means we read everything you gave us and it was all correct, but you didn't finish giving us, right? So if you gave me uh, two UTF-8 code units, two bytes, and I needed three to uh, complete, you know, the, the smiley face you wanted me to emoji the emoji to make for you, well then, you know, invalid, you know, incomplete input is is, is exactly what you would do. And insufficient output space is the last one where it's just, oh, there isn't enough space in the buffer you handed me, right? So we're not gonna like, we do, by default, we don't like overflow your buffers. Um, we tell you, no, no, there's not enough space to, to do what you want to. And, and if any of these trigger, then we don't output any information at all into the, um, uh, into the final output buffer, right? If any of these trigger. So for an example encoding, um, here's some of the result types you get back. So when you call these low level functions like encode one, decode one, these are the kinds of things you get out, right? And they, they contain five pieces of information. Um, it contains the input, which is the input that you put in, uh, 
you know, post, uh, post decode or encode. Um, and we also give you the output, which is the, uh, after the encoder decode, like the rest of the buffer. So we, we use up some of the buffer, you know, the output, obviously your, your, your code points or code units, and then we leave you with the rest of the buffer. Um, we return you a reference to the state that you handed us. Um, and if, you know, that's the case, then that's fine. Um, we return an encoding error. So if something does go wrong, if this is not equal to encoding error, colon, colon, okay, then we, you know, you get to know about that. And we also have a Boolean if you handled an error. And this is kind of important because there's some uh, error handlers that will insert uh, like replacement characters and other things and then like erase the encoding error to say everything's fine, it's okay. But you still want to know if there's like an error happening, you did actually handle an error anyway, right? If you did make replacements, but we still kind of scrub the, the encoding error, error code, um, you still want to know if that's happening. So that's what handled error is for. And it's literally the same thing. It's for both decoded and encoded. It's literally the same thing. It's just, you know, what, what depends on what the input is and what the output is. And that's where you, you're doing encode or decode. Some more results types. Um, this is like literally, it's literally the same thing, um, except in this case, it's for U8. And we're going to talk about what this, this U8 means um, in a second. But it's literally the same thing. You have an input of a car 8 T-span, output of car 3 T-span, and then everything's identical. Um, we have some error handlers, and I talk a lot about this in the part two presentation um, about what you can do with this and like the different ways that you can like you can do replacement characters or you can find the first valid sequence and do a replacement character. And I won't go in too much into detail here, but basically you have a function that has a signature of taking the result by value and returning the result by value, taking the encoding that you gave it by val uh, by const reference, and then also handing you a span of any characters that were read but weren't used uh, to produce uh, the final. Uh, value. Um, and this is kind of helpful uh, for, for uh, things like forward, for like uh, things like um, uh, input iterators. For for example, if you're reading from like std c in with a std i stream iterator, um, once we read a value and go forward, we can't really go backwards. So uh, it's important that we give you any code points or code units that we read from the stream uh, instead of just like letting, losing them to the time whenever an error happens. And so that's what those, that's what the, these three parameters are. Um, again, we're not going to go too much into it. There's other talks that will that again go into this in depth, but it's just for the purpose of setup and and, and make sure that you can follow along. So here's an example of exotic encoding. Um, so there's actually an encoding called UTF EBCDEC, and you've probably never heard of it, um, and that's great. Uh, so if you never heard of it and you haven't used it, uh, bless your soul. <laughs> um, so the, we have the seven you know lucky things here, right? So. We have our three type depths, so we have a code unit of car, right? It's just it's just a car input, right? And that's just when you're when you're working on you know IBM machines and you're working with EBCDEC, it's just car. Um, you have an output code point, which is a car thirty two T, so we're outputting Unicode code points. Um, our state is just an empty struct because there's no like shift statements or special sequences we need to calculate or do anything with. Um, we have a max code points of one, which is uh, the maximum number of code points a single decode one operation can output, right? So when we call decode one, we can only output one code point at most. And finally, we have max code units, which in this case is six, because that's the maximum number of code units that can be output from a single operation. Um, and that's exactly everything that you're gonna need as far as the, the types and, and variables are concerned. And then for the functions, you have an encode one function and a decode one function. And the whole point about this is that for encode one, we, you take an input of, of, of things and it outputs uh, the, 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 it outputs the actual uh, uh, characters that are in the encoding, um, or you decode one and you take in code points and you, you take in uh, characters and you output the, the code point, uh, sequence of code points, right? And so in this case, you only get out one code point when you're doing decoding, but you can get up, you can get from zero up to six code units from a uh, uh, encode one call. And that's basically how that, that works. Here's a more common encoding. Um, so if we were to have a UTF-8, I mean, it's literally identical in almost every single way, except in this case, the math code units is four, um, because a single code point can only be expanded to four code units, and that's like the maximum expansion. And the reason we have these max code points and code units types on, on both the UTF EBCDEC and the UTF-8 is because uh, this allows us to have, uh, to know the maximum size of an output given any input uh, that we do 
for any operation, right? And this is again important for what we'll see down the line uh, later in this presentation uh, for, for memory usage and everything else. And I'm absolutely deadly serious when I mean that everything, literally everything, can be built out of these sevens, right? I can bulk encode, decode, and, and even transcode between A and B uh, using, just this, using just this interface. I can validate text using just this interface, and I can do counting, right? How many code points or code units will come out on the other side? Um, and I can also build some ranges on top of this, right? So if I, you know, I want to have a lazy range that doesn't necessarily bulk and code and take up memory, but I need to walk the code points one by one, I can create flexible ranges that don't, that take a fixed amount of memory uh, and, you know, output code points that I can say use for free type or, you know, harf buzz or uh, maybe Pango or some other library. And then this all, all works. Sort of, almost. Um, so there's, there's one other operation that can be added. It's not required, but it can be added. Um, decode one backwards and encode one backwards. Um, so iterator is obtained from encoding view and decoding view uh, uh, types, like which are views that allow you to walk over a sequence of text and, and work with it. Um, in order to be able to go backwards, you need to be have one of these functions because I can't like synthesize a backwards operation from those seven. Um, but this is a very rare case and it's not required, um, but it's just still good to know that, you know, if you want to go backwards over some text, which is, this is rare, uh, usually, usually the only people who ask to reverse text are like interviewers, honestly. Um, you, this is, this is what supports that. These, these two functions are in support of that, but it's not the, it's not part of the required core base, right? And I also want to be very specific about why is encode one and decode one the thing that we're using rather than just, you know, a bulk encode or a bulk decode uh, uh, thing, right? That doesn't only output one unit of information. And the reason we do this is because it saves us higher levels of abstraction, right? So if we only output one unit of information, only consume one unit of information, what it means is, is that I can predictably size my output buffer and know I have exactly enough to handle one unit of complete output. And this is important when I want to do things like make ranges or preserve memory, uh, preserve certain memory uh, uh, constraints, or if I want to make it so that I never have an insufficient output error, right? If I have a range-based API that always greedily consumes the most amount of information it can and outputs as much as it possibly can, then I end up in a really bad state where every single call I make to the API can always have insufficient output as an error, right? By making it so I only output one unit of information, not only do I make the API less complicated for an end user to implement, right? So if you were writing your own encoding and you wanted to implement encode one and decode one, it's easier, but it also means that a class of errors never happens, right? And it also means that I never have to do things like save state between encoding object calls and other things like that. It also gives the end user access to data to do as they want with it, right? And so by not overly consuming and not having to store any extra state, I can enable people who have networking buffers and everything else to reuse their buffers and other things like that without requiring them to also cart around uh, potentially stateless encoding types, which is very much important. So some of the standard encodings that we're going to get for CSS 23 are the encoding scheme type, which will allow you to basically take uh, other encodings and apply an endianness to them. So if you wanted UTF-16 little endian, you can do that. If you wanted a wide execution with a big endian spin, you can do that. Um, whatever else, right? And it's just this kind of uh, generic scheme type. Um, then the you know your concrete encodings are your ASCII, your narrow execution, and your wide execution. The narrow execution and wide execution correspond to CAR and uh, WCART as defined by the locale in the library, so that's why it's execution. Then we have narrow literal and wide literal, which correspond to the assumed encoding that your compiler dumps out when you know you give it a string literal and it says put the string literal in my binary when you're serializing that's what narrow literal is right and it can be different from what the actual execution encoding is uh the narrow execution the wide execution encoding that ends up being run by your system um so that's why those are two different things and then we just have the typical utf 8 1632 yeah typical uh basic stuff we we talked about this in part one of the uh, uh of of these presentations as well if you want more information now, some of you are like, okay, listen, like, there is a lot more encodings, right? I've, I've spent my time on the web. I've spent my time, you know, I'm, I'm from Japan. I, Shift.js is still very prevalent. Um, I'm in Russia. I have a bunch of other different encodings that I really need to handle here, right? Like, 
there needs to be a lot more encodings than this if I if you want me to use this with like my male client or this or that or to build out some of these these other abstractions. And so, you know, in late CS23 or perhaps early CS26, um, we do plan to provide the entire what WG suite of encodings, right? I mean, I say we as in we as Shepherd's Oasis do plan to provide all of that, but you know, we'll see how it goes with the committee. Um, and also, you know, legacy encodings, code pages, library. For example, Microsoft, if you look in their, their open source STL, you can see that they have a wide variety of encodings baked in. And maybe as a vendor, it's personally interesting to them to ship additional encodings, and so they can. Um, and so also, just a sorting types, you can kind of collect these encodings and do that. But also, I the, the, the really big point here is that you can make your own. There's no special tricks. No secrets, no, no, no special magic implementer foo that you need to know here, right? Everything just comes from these seven different basis operations. And that is incredibly important. And we're going to talk about why that's important uh, 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 going forward, right? And, and why you can build almost everything based on these seven operations. So let's, let's extrapolate some base operations, right? Let's, let's, do the, let's do the math here and everything else. Um, so if I want to do transcating validation or counting or a bunch of other stuff, right? The idea here is that with those seven operations, that's everything I need. So let's, let's talk a little about transcoding, right? You know, going from one encoding to another. I have a simple idea. I have a from encoding and I have a to encoding. They're both encoding objects. And I have these encode one decode functions. And so what I, my, my, what I postulate here is that if I have a common code point between them, if they can represent all the same values, you know, within reason, um, and it does not error during the encode step or the decode step, then I can always transcode. That's it. That's that's the you know you know if this was a math book, there'd be you know theorem and it'd be in that like cool box and you know theorem with the italic text like blah blah you know simple idea you know from encoding to encoding you know you know you get the the the, the upside down sigma signs and all other cool and all the other cool stuff you find in math books right. But the idea here is that our theorem is that we can always transcode if if these hold right. This is a uh, the diagram from the part one talk, the CEPCon 2019 talk. And so as you can see here, right, we have this idea, right, that you can take an encoded single input, right? I can decode that to a Unicode code point. I can take that Unicode code point. I can then encode it. And then from there, I have an encoded single output. And through this loop, through this four-step dance we do, we get access to every single encoding as long as they have a common code point type. In this case, the common code point type is almost 99.999% of the time UTF-32, right? That we get code points out and that it works. And that's what that means. And so that's this is this is the picture form of the theorem here, right? It's probably not math book ready, but you know, it gets the job done. And so let's, let's do a little bit of setup here, right? So we have this transcode result type, and we're going from UTF EPSIDEC UE um, to UTF-8 U8. And so in this case, we have a C-SPAN input, we have a U8 uh, of output, right? UTF-8 output and the, the C-SPAN of input, right? We have a from state and a to state, which again, they're just empty structs because there's no state for uh, UTF EPSIDEC and UTF-8. Um, and we track the encoding error and the handle error, right? And that's, that's just how that works. Um, so let's take a look at uh, uh, if this, this works now, if this holds. All right, so let's let's implement transcode. So in this case, I'm, I'm being simple here, right? We have the handler type. It's just a default text handler. It works. Um, we get the encoding state of UTF of UTF EPSIDIC. That's our from state. We have the encoding state of UTF-8, and that's our to state. And then we have this wonderful, wonderful uh, in-between T, which is just the encoding cone point of UTF EPSIDIC. Now, in between some of these lines, there's going to be some static asserts that basically confirm that the code point types are indeed compatible. Um, and this is implemented in the library, but for the slide where we're not going to, you know, the, the, this actually outputs a really big message, so I can't fit that on the slide. So you just have to look at this. Um, but in this case, we, we have our, our encoding code point. We have our in-between type. Uh, and now we can make a buffer of it, a just a plain C array. That takes the maximum code points of UTF EPSIDIC, right? So UTF EPSIDIC can output at maximum one code point, right? So we have a buffer that's big enough to handle all of the output from UTF EPSIDIC, right? Then we create a span over that buffer, right? So you want to view the whole buffer, right? So we take a span of the intermediate buffer, right? And that's, there we go. We got our array. It's, it's all set. It's all cool, right? Perfect. Um, and then we begin a for loop. 
this for loop, you know, we just use the double semicolon to mean that we're going to run forever until we reach our stop conditions. And so here is the basic idea. If I have a from encoding and I call decode one on the input into the intermediate and I pass the handler and, and the necessary state variable, that result will get me decoded code points. I'll have code points in my hands in, in, in the intermediate buffer, right? I, I fix up the input after I do that by moving the, the from results input back into the, the input type so that I can update the input variable. Um, and then I check if the error code of the result is not equal to okay, right? If it's not, then we bail, right? We give the we give our current input, right? How much we read, the output, uh, we give the error code um, that we got, and then all the other information like the state and everything else, right? Um, but if there is no error, then we compute the used, right? And what the used is, is you know, this is this looks kind of weird, right? We're calling intermediate on the, the intermediate span, we're getting its data, and then we're getting the from result output dot data, which is of the same type as intermediate, right? It's another span, and we're calling dot data on it to get some more information. And the way this works is very simple, right? The first row is our current intermediate, right? It's the actual span. The second row is our actual is our second span that comes from the from result that dot output. And what this means is is that we are basically measuring from the beginning of the intermediate to where we stopped at the from result output, right? So it always inc it always writes into the, the output range and then stops at the when it's done writing things. And so we basically are, we're just measuring the distance between those two. And that gives us what's used. That gives us the used portion of the of the data, right? And that's that's what we're getting, that's what we're gunning for here. Now from there, we need to do the second half of the operation, right? Which is encode into new code units, right? So we take our use span, right? That we that we computed doing that we computed doing all this, right? That that blue marks part is the use span, and then we give the original output, right? The original output that we're going to write into, and the handler, and then you know the the, the state. Um, we update the output if. We update the output, and then we check if the two results error code uh, is wrong. And if it's wrong, then we return, we move the output, and we return the error code, and everything's wrong, and whatever else. But if we succeed, well, we check if the input is empty, and if it is, we stop. Otherwise, we loop back, and we start doing it all over again, right? And until we break, uh, or until we return an error, um, we keep going until we can finally say, return the input and the output as they are, etc., etc., right? And so the input and output here represent the... Uh, represent data that hasn't been touched yet. So you input the data that uh, uh, that hasn't been touched yet, and we, we increment it forward all the way, and then we kind of hand you back to say, we haven't used, this is the part of the span or the output or whatever else that hasn't been touched yet. And that's, that's how that works. And well, that's it. Um, this whole loop here that I, that I just described to you is is the entirety of it, right? We just implemented transcode, right? Between two different encoders, we implemented transcode by calling these defined functions on the thing. And that's it. That is literally all you need to do transcoding, right? And if you just replace the specific hard coding of, of, of the UTF EBCDIC and the UTF-8 here, you can do this between any two encodings, as long as the code point types are common. And that is what, I, as I've just proven to you, is possible with this API. So, so let's move on from that, right? And let's talk about something else, right? What about validation, right? Like, I want to verify that some text is in the proper encoding or that it can be uh, in the proper encoding, right? And so the idea here is somewhat simple. Um, it's the same loop and check idea, right? So we have, we get our code point, our code unit, we get the uh, uh, from state, the to state. We get a buffer of the code points and a buffer of code units. We create an intermediate buffer and an output intermediate buffer. And what we do here is for this, we do the same loop, right? So we call from result, decode one, the input to the intermediate. We check that the error code happens, blah, blah, blah. Right, then we use the span to get the used calculation all over again. Then we call encode one with the used to the output, and we get the handler and the Tuesday, blah, blah, you know, it's the same loop, right? Anytime we fail with an error, we return false, right? Because obviously it can't have worked if we get an error, 
right? Then that means that the text isn't valid, right? Because there's no way it could possibly be represented in this, this code, right? Then we move on to the next part of validation, right? Which we create a mirror input, right? It's just the same used calculation, but we're doing it for the output. Uh, we're doing it for the output of the to result rather than the output of the front result, right? So this is at the very end. We're getting, we're calculating the used of the output, right? And so we get a C-span of mirror input. And what this enables us to do is we check, is the mirror input that we got from the operation, right? We did the whole loop, right? We did, we did one cycle of the loop, right? We went from the input to the output and then back to the input again using the exact same encoding type, right? Like I, I want to emphasize here that the, the thing here is that we're not using a from encoding and a to encoding, we're using the encoding itself, right? It, both times. And so when you do decode one and encode one and you loop it through, right? The whole point is that if you go, if you round trip through the encoding, right? No error should happen and the input should be exactly identical to the output that you get, right? So the, the input should be identical to the mirror input, right? So we do std equals, you, and we, you know, we get the iterators and we call the function. And if it's not equal, we return false. Otherwise, we update the input and we loop back around, right? And if this loops through the whole thing and we reach input.empty, then we return true, right? And well, that's it, right? We, we literally already defined transcoding as decode some code points. If it error, return with error. Else, take the decoded code points and put it into the encode step. If error, return with error. Else, loop back if the input is not empty, right? Except in this case, rather than returning with error, we're just returning false for the fact that it can't be, right? it's not valid text. It's not valid in that encoding, right? But it's, it's literally the exact same idea, right? And so the whole point here is that this whole thing holds up and works without any additional effort, right? Now, of course, you can also even do this with the lazier possible, right? Like you can use transcode to do the actual validate, right? Rather than implementing validate as a loop, you can implement it as a call to transcode, right? So we call transcode and we give it the input and the out and an output buffer, but instead of actually uh, uh, providing a to encoding and a, and a from encoding, we just use the same encoding twice, right? We use the encoding from the to and the encoding as a from encoding, right? And what that means is that we're basically doing, we're basically checking between itself, can it loop, can it do a full loop, right, of encoding and decoding amongst itself? And if it can do that, we check if the result error code is okay, and we also do a std equals if the input is complete, is exactly equal to the output in both size and actual values. And that's it. This is this is a valid, perfectly good implementation of validate, right? And it's built entirely off of the transcode call. Now, for obvious reasons, I don't recommend this, right? We are literally creating a std vector the size of the input, right? Like that's going to be a little bit wasteful. That that's going to be just, just a tad, just a tad bit wasteful there. Um, so obviously we don't want to do it like this, but the whole point is that it works and it scales, right? So we use a loop version because obviously we don't want to have infinite memory consumption, but the whole point is that uh, it works, right? And that's extremely useful. So now let's also do counting, right? So how many code units or code points will this operation yield? And <laughs> I'm not actually going to do this one for you, right? It's we we'll leave this one as an exercise for the viewer, but it's 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 not hard. It's really not hard. It's not a trick. It's the same idea, right? It's just instead of counting it, right? We use the use calculation from the last from the last portion of the loop, and we just you know count the code points or count the code units, and bada bing, bada boom, we've got ourselves exactly what we're looking for, um, and that's just exactly how that works. Now, I'm not actually going to leave it to you as an exercise. I'm not going to say, yeah, go take these things, go take these encoding objects and go implement transcode, validate, encode, count, decode, count, all this other stuff. No, you don't, no, 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 we're not going to do that, right? We, the, the, the paper, and you can read it in the paper, the official C++ paper, the working draft that's on my blog. Um, we provide all this for you, right? And not only do we provide all for you, but we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we do the templating, right? We, we take the error handles, we'll do the checking. Is this a proper range? You know, do we need to boil this down to a range, et cetera, et cetera, right? But we'll have decode and decode into, right? Where decode into actually takes the output and you, we output in the output. But if you don't care about the output, then we just call it, you could just call decode and we'll like spin up a vector for you, whatever, if you're lazy. Um, we also do this for encode, where we have encode into, where you can pass the output, um, and we'll fill it up uh, as much as we can, or we'll just, you know, or, or you just call encode and we'll, we'll create an, uh, 
an output and we'll do a reserve call and a bunch of other stuff and hand you a string. That's exactly what you wanted. Um, we also have validate calls. Um, and we also have, uh, you know, the encode one and decode one accounts, right? And we provide this all for you, right? We, it's templated. We do all the shenanigans underneath, right? But the whole point is that you can plug in any encoding object or any two encoding objects when it comes to transcode and it works, right? So to, to give you an idea, um, this is just kind of a quick basic of using some of the basic overloads, right? So you can call in, in the desired API, what you do is you can call std text validate as, and you can check if, can I take this UTF-32 heart and like put it in my, 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 my literal encoding, right? And this will assert at compile time, right? Because all of this is const expert, right? That you can handle that heart, right? That can be put in your literal encoding, right? So if you have certain things that need UTF support, right, you can static assert a bunch of characters in the, you know, the bilingual multiplane or some emoji that are farther than that, and it works, right? You'll be able to check at compile time, like, no, 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 your, 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 your literal encoding needs to be able to handle this, right? And that's important. Um, you can also just call std text encode. Like I said, there's simple overloads. So you could just pass a string in, you call encode, you get out UTF-8 emoji. We generally assume that when you're doing encoding and you pass us a UTF-32 string, we'll just kind of assume you want to go to UTF-8, so that's the default. Um, but if you don't, right, you can pass in like std text ASCII with the replacement handler. And this actually just ends up as a, uh, a question mark um, because uh, ASCII can't handle uh, uh, anything more than that. And that's just the way that works. But most importantly uh, about all of this, about the simple API and everything else, the basis never changes. The seven operations are still the seven operations you use to build everything. Now, obviously, there's arguments to make for performance and everything else, but the entire point is that you can, at minimum, write these seven things, and you will have perfect interoperability and safety and everything else for the entire ecosystem at no cost to you. And I want you, I really want to emphasize this, right? The basis never changes. The basis operations are what we compose the entirety of our text encoding APIs out of and enjoy full support without having to do any additional work or labor. No additional work on the standard library implementer's part and no additional work on your part. And that is why this API is infinitely scalable and better than almost every single API out there currently in the world. It's this, just these, these lucky, lucky seven is exactly what you want, right? And obviously, if you want more speed and safety, there's different hooks and other things you can do. And I described some of that in part one. I'll also be going back, going into that in part four, which might happen at either CPP Russia, which might be online and some other stuff. Um, but the whole point is that you have the seven magic number and that encapsulates everything you need. And it's all yours. Each encoding object is its own type and it strongly controls its semantics and representation, right? And there's no committee telling you what to do. No standard library saying it's not important enough to be added and that your use case isn't good enough. There's no gods, no masters, no one to stand in our way. And that means that we will seize the means of production. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, and that's what's the magical bit here. Um, and of course, the other magical part here about this whole thing is you for listening. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for tuning into this presentation. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you're excited about the future of text for C++. Um, I hope that we can get this API through to the standards committee and make a real difference. Um, I just want to spend a moment thanking all of my wonderful individual patrons and sponsors um, who have... Uh, wonderfully helped me up during this time, especially even now. Um, I know it's very hard to uh, part with your hard-earned dollars in a time like this, um, and I'm super glad that you are supporting uh, my work and everything else that I do, whether it's standards work, uh, Itsy Bitsy, the Bit Library, everything else. Please, please uh, pat yourselves on the back. I hope that I am returning by working on these things and doing these things for the Standards Committee and the C Committee that I'm returning great value to you. I also wanted to thank the NEN standards body in the Netherlands who took me on uh, 
on a recommendation from someone and have allowed me uh, by their sponsorship to continue to attend the WG14C standards meetings and push for new APIs that make this whole thing better. Um, so very much thank you to NEN. You can check them out on their website. Um, and of course, there's emails, phone numbers, and everything else there. Um, if you're Dutch or even Dutch adjacent and you want to help with these things, uh, you can definitely ask and, and they'll be happy to help you out. Um, and maybe even help get you to, as long as you're pushing, you know, for standards and other things like that, they'd be able to help you out. Um, and that would be great. And I just wanted to thank all the various people who put together various media um, that I use in these slides. Um, you know, just giving credit where credit is due. Uh, and of course, uh, if you'd like to be part of one of those people who helps, one of part of one of those patrons, um, you want to support us, a vision for fluid text handling in C and C++. Um, there's a plan at the portfolio text link. There is, you can support the plan with the, uh, 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 at the link there. Um, and of course, um, if you don't want to just support the plan directly with donations, you can always contract and consult us. Um, please send an email to shepherd at soasis.org. We do pretty much everything, system profiling, hardening, testing, performance. We're also sort of known as the text people, scripting on small devices, a whole bunch of things, C, C++, whatever language you uh, got in mind or whatever task you have at hand, uh, we will be there to uh, provide a wonderful place for you to rest your head easy, knowing that it will be taken care of. Any questions? Okay, thanks very much for that talk. That was, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, we're gonna attempt a, a live Q&A. They've been a little bit patchy, uh, but we're gonna give it a shot. Uh, jean he does not have video, so you will just see me, but hopefully jean Heed's audio will come in and it won't be all um, stuttery. Let's give it a shot. Uh, just give me one second. Okay, we are live. Sean Heat, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, really glad that the talk is uh, over and uh, all that fun stuff is, is already said. Cool, okay, does anyone have any questions? Uh, well, I don't, uh, I don't see a question, but there is a comment in the chat about not being presentable as uh, UTF-32. And so one of the things I'm going to talk about is that you can choose a different code point type that is not UTF-32, um, and it still works with this API. Now, it will automatically interrupt with literally the rest of the uh, standard library because it, the standard library will traffic mainly in code points, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your API no longer works um, or that you can't use this API in your own small ecosystem. So, I really want to emphasize right, this is a flexible API for everybody, literally everybody, including people who are not fully in the current ecosystem. Right? So the whole goal is to help you get out of your plastic ecosystem and move into a better place. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, it does sound like the, the sound is not coming through that great, but um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, that we'll, we'll try and answer here, and uh, we can also uh, write them in the chat in case people can't hear properly. But the two questions are, uh, will we get something like this in the standard, and um, is this available for us to try right now? Uh, so one of the things uh, that uh, I'm trying to do is get obviously get this the standard, um, so but I can't really fix that right. It's been on the committee how they like the approach and whatever they like about it, etc. Et um, and in that case, it's, it's sort of depending on uh, uh, I can't. Sound is completely uh, cutting out now. 
Uh, okay, that's too bad. Uh, okay. uh, maybe John Hughes, you can answer uh, any other questions in chat, and uh, we'll we'll give up on the um, on the the Skype for now. It's uh, it's not playing nicely with us. So uh, yeah, feel free to keep your questions coming in chat, and John Hughes will get to you in text. And uh, thanks very much for joining us, John Heed. Probably. Okay, right. Um, so our next talk is going to be in um, 40 minutes. And it's going to be on uh, C++ development with Visual Studio Code uh, with Julia Reed. So please... Uh, Join us then, and I will see you then.
Okay, everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're going to get started on the next talk, which is I'm going to have Julia Reed, who is the program manager for the C++ Visual Studio Code extension, telling us about C++ development with Visual Studio Code. And we will get started right away. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia. I'm a program manager on the Visual C++ team at Microsoft. I focus specifically on the VS Code C++ extension. Thank you for joining my session today. I'm really excited to talk about how to use VS Code for C++ development. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'll start by going over the topics that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, one thing is I wanna show you the things that you can do with VS Code. The beauty of VS Code is that you can customize it to use it however you'd like, whether that is strictly as a lightweight text editor or as a full IDE with build and debug support. There are also a bunch of non-C++ specific features that VS Code has, such as the remote development extensions and the live share extensions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those today as well. I will also talk about which tools we recommend for cross-platform development in VS Code. Cross-platform development is a super popular scenario these days, and VS Code is a great option for that because it can be run on Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. I will also talk about VC Package today, which is an open source cross-platform C++ package manager. It is consistently reported that package management is a huge pain point for C++ developers. We see this in the Stack Overflow survey results, the ISO CPP survey results, and more. So I want to show you how you can use VC Package to make managing your project dependencies easier across all platforms. VC Package also can be integrated with VS Code, which we will go over in the demo. Uh, this part of the demo also includes a preview of an exciting new feature. It has not officially been released yet, so I'm going to show you what we have in the works. Um, and you can get a feel of what's coming next with VC Package and some enhancements uh, you can expect to see in the near future. So let's talk about the things that you can do with VS Code. As I mentioned, it's up to you how extensive you want your VS Code experience to be. If you prefer to use it strictly as a lightweight text editor and take care of your building and debugging outside of VS Code, that works. If you would like to use it as a full IDE, it can do that too. Uh, VS Code has great C++ language support. It has IntelliSense, code completion, a bunch of productivity features such as find all references, rename, go to definition, and more. You can build and debug your C++ projects in VS Code. It will find whichever compiler or debugger you have installed on your machine. Uh, we also have native CMake project support in VS Code, as we recently started maintaining the CMake tools extension. CMake is one of the most popular build systems for C++ projects, especially for open source projects. And uh, the CMake Tools extension makes it super easy to configure CMake projects in VS Code. VS Code has great remote development extensions as well. This includes the SSH extension, the Containers extension, and the WSL extension, which is Windows Subsystem for Linux. Uh, finally, I'll talk about the collaborative development features of VS Code. VS Code has a live share extension pack, uh, which enables you to start a collaborative session from VS Code, share the URL to that session with anyone that you trust, and then they can join that session from their instance of VS Code on their machine, and you can work together. You can even do a collaborative debugging session. All right, so for my demos today, I'm going to use the Super Tux project. It is an open source classic 2D game. You can clone the GitHub repository, uh, which is what I did. And Super Tux has a great community of developers that contribute new levels to the game. So it's a great open source project um, for demo. All right, let's get started. 
All right, so I have my SuperTux project open in VS Code on my laptop right now, and I'm going to show you some of the cool C++ language features that we have in VS Code. So let's start with the find all references. I want to find all references of this mState variable here in my uh, bad guy header file. So I can just do uh, right click and then select find all references, or you can do shift alt F12 if you prefer to use the keyboard shortcut. And this will find both confirmed and not confirmed references for this variable. So a confirmed reference means it's not only a text match, it's also a semantic match. And non-confirmed references mean it's a text match, but it might not be a semantic match. It could be in a comment, in a string, in an inactive code block, etc. So here you can see in this references pane on the left, in the top section, these are all of my confirmed results. And down here, these are other references results that cannot be confirmed. So now let's do a rename. So let's say I want to rename this variable to x state. <laughs> so I can again do a right click and then select rename symbol from the context menu, or I can simply click F2, which will prompt me to rename the variable. All right, so I'm going to type in x state, but I want to preview all of these changes before committing them. So I'm going to do shift enter to preview. And again, this is doing a find all references before showing me uh, the references that will be renamed. Cool. So in this refactor preview tab, I can look at all of the references um, that are candidates for my rename and select which ones I want to include or exclude in my changes. Um, so let's go ahead and go through these. And then once, once you feel good about the changes that you are committing, you can just select this check mark right here to apply refactoring. All right, so now I'll show you go to definition. Go back to my files. All right, so let's say I wanna know where this set flip function is defined. Um, so I will do a right click and select go to definition, or you can just do F12 for the keyboard shortcut. And you can also go to declaration, so I will show you that as well. And this should take me to the header file. There we go. It's also worth calling out that if you want to see the definition or the declaration, but you don't want to actually navigate to a new file, then you can use the peak capability by doing control click, selecting peak from the contents me context menu, and then let's do peak definition. There we go. So this gives me a little preview of where this is defined without actually taking me to that file. All right, so now that you've seen some of the core C++ language features in VS Code, let's talk a bit about cross-platform development. Cross-platform development is super popular these days, we see in a lot of survey feedback that people are developing for more than one platform. They are developing for a platform that is different from their host OS. Um, and VS Code is a great option for both of those scenarios. Uh, it runs on Linux, Windows, and Mac OS, as I mentioned before. It has native support for CMake, and CMake is a cross-platform meta build system. Um, and because VS Code has such great support for CMake projects, you can have your CMake project as a cross-platform project and configure it on VS Code regardless of what OS you're using. VS Code also integrates well with VC Package, and VC Package works across all platforms as well. So if you're using uh, CMake and you're using VC Package in your project, uh, that sets you up to be able to configure your project easily in VS Code across Windows, Linux, and Mac. Also, VS Code enables 
targeting different platforms through remote development extensions. Um, I briefly mentioned these before, but there's the SSH extension, the containers extension, and the Windows subsystem for Linux extension. In today's demo, I am going to show you how to use the CMake Tools extension to configure, build, and debug your CMake projects. I will show you how I've integrated VC package with CMake Tools extension uh, to manage all of SuperTux's dependencies. And I will then use the remote SSH extension to SSH into my Linux VM and show you that we can configure everything following the same exact steps on Linux and it just works. Um, it'll use GCC and GDB, but all of the steps that you'll take to configure and build your project are exactly the same. The CMake Tools extension makes it very easy to configure CMake projects in VS Code. You can create a new CMake project from scratch, you can turn an existing project into a CMake project, or you can configure an existing CMake project. In other words, if your project doesn't already have a cmakelist.txt, this extension will create one for you. And if it does have one, the extension will find it and use it. So this project, SuperTux, already has a cmakelist.txt. So let's just go ahead and start configuring the project. There are two things that we need to do to configure this project using CMake tools. The first is select a kit. A kit contains the project agnostic configuration agnostic, build instructions for your code, such as the name of the compiler that you're using. So at the bottom of the screen in the blue status bar, you'll see the no active kit button. I can go ahead and click that. And I see an option of kits that I can use. The first time you do this, you'll have to click scan for kits, which will search for compilers on your computer. It'll search the path environment variable, it'll look for Visual Studio instances, if for some reason after scanning for kits, the compiler you want to use is not showing up, you can actually edit this CMake kits JSON file directly and add it yourself. So I've already scanned for kits, which is why you see a list of compilers on my computer. So I'm going to select the one that I want to use. You can see it's loading the kit. Great, it's loaded. The second thing I need to do is select a variant. These are instructions for how to build the project. So by default, CMake Tools extension will show you four variants that you can use, each corresponding to a default build type. If I click right here, we can see what they are. So I'm going to select debug. And now it is configuring my project. All right, so now that our project has been successfully configured, our build files have been written to this new build folder in our project directory. So right here, SuperTux build, you can see it in the left, build folder. And these are the files that CMake Tools generated for us. So now we can go ahead and build our project. So uh, one thing we can do is select which targets we'd like to build. So if we select this button here at the bottom that says all, you'll see a list of targets. I'm going to select all. So we can go ahead and build by just clicking that command in the blue status bar. It's also worth calling out that all of these commands in the blue status bar that are provided by the CMake Tools extension can be invoked from the command palette. So if you just do control shift P, to open the command palette and then type CMake, you'll see all of the CMake tools extension commands right here. All right, so we have a successful build. Now we can debug. So you see I set a breakpoint in the main.cpp file. And down here at the bottom, we can select the target to launch, which we have as SuperTux2. And we can just click debug and it'll start the debugger. We can also click on the CMake tab on the left and you'll see your CMake target here as well, SuperTux2, and you can right click and select debug from this context menu as well. All right, so now we have launched the debugger 
and you can see it's stopping at the breakpoint that I set. And on the left in the debugger panel, we show the values of local variables, of registers. You can add a watch variable, which is a variable whose value you want to watch change over time. We show the call stack and the list of breakpoints. So you can um, disable breakpoints directly from here. You can add a new breakpoint, type the name of the function you want to break at, and there you go. So I'm going to disable this breakpoint. I'm going to continue uh, stepping over and finish running the program, and our Super Tux GUI should launch. And there it is. I'll just take a moment. There we go. All right, so there we have our game. So we just successfully built and run SuperTux in VS Code using the CMake Tools extension. And those are the general steps for configuring a CMake project in VS Code. So now let's take it one step further and look at how we integrated VC Package with CMake Tools to manage all of SuperTux's dependencies. So first I'll give you a little bit of information about VC Package. VC Package is a cross-platform command line package manager for C++. There are over 1,300 libraries supported in the VC Package catalog across Windows, Mac, and Linux. It is open source, and there are a bunch of benefits to using VC Package to manage your C++ packages. Uh, first is it simplifies the acquisition and installation of third-party libraries. All you need to do is run VC Package, install, and then the name of the library from the command line. Also. The libraries are all routinely tested against each other for compatibility to ensure a high quality catalog. The last thing I'll mention is that you can integrate CMake with VC Package so that CMake can find all packages that were installed through that instance of VC Package when configuring and building your project. Installing VC Package is very simple, and it is the same experience on Linux, Mac, and Windows. Uh, the first thing you'll do is clone the GitHub repository. You can see the link in the slide. Then you run the bootstrapper in the VC Package root folder. And finally, you can run VC Package Integrate Install to integrate VC Package with Visual Studio and VS Code. So let's take a look at how this works with SuperTux. All right, so as I mentioned in the slides, once you clone the VC package GitHub repository and bootstrap it, you can run VC package integrate install to integrate VC package with VS Code. So let me show you what that looks like. Uh, in my terminal, I'm going to navigate to the instance of VC package that I'd like to use. And I'm going to run VC package integrate install. So now this integrates uh, VC package, this specific instance of VC package with VS Code so that VS Code can use it for um, configuring IntelliSense for source files. It also um, tells you what you need to set the CMake toolchain file path to be such that CMake can find the packages installed with uh, this instance of VC package by invoking the find packages command. So in order to hook this up with the CMake Tools extension, uh, we just need to edit the CMake Toolchain file property for the CMake Tools extension. And we can do that in the Workspace Settings JSON. So the Workspace Settings JSON lives in the .vs code folder for your project. Um, if you don't see it, that just means you haven't configured any workspace specific settings yet, and you can get there uh, from the command palette. So let's do Control shift p typing preferences, open workspace settings. So this opens a UI where you can edit settings for your workspace. You can also edit settings at the user level and you can edit settings specific to the extensions that you're using. So we're interested in the CMake tools configuration settings. So some of these settings you can edit directly in the UI. Others you'll see it'll tell you to edit in settings.json. 
So that's what we did in order to uh, set the CMake toolchain file path. So I can show you that. Uh, here we go, CMake configure settings. So I had just clicked edit in settings JSON and it created this CMake configure settings object whereas I specified the CMake toolchain file path and I added the VC package build property and marked it as on. So how VC package works today is customers have to manually install all of their project dependencies using VC package and configure them so that CMake can find them. We're working on a new feature, which we are very excited about, um, and it has not officially been released yet, but I'm going to demo what we currently have in the works um, right now so you can get a feel of where VC package is heading and some enhancements that are coming soon. Uh, so this new feature is a manifest file and in your project folder, so vcpackage.json file, that lists all of your project dependencies. And then VC package will detect that uh, VC package JSON file and take care of installing all of the listed dependencies, any dependencies that those libraries have, and configuring them so that CMake can find them all automatically. And I'll show you what that looks like. So we have this VC package JSON file for SuperTux. So these are all of the dependencies uh, that SuperTux has. And um, so yeah, as, as VC package six today, you would have to go in and manually install these VC package install each of these packages. Um, but the new experience um, is that from your project directory, so let me navigate to my project directory. I can uh, call VC package. So install set my triplet as x64 windows specify binary caching. So what this will do is it'll find that VC package JSON file, that manifest file in my SuperTux project, and it will go ahead and install all of these dependencies if they're not already installed and configure them so that CMake can find these packages. So let's click enter. There we go. So all of these packages were already installed, which is why I was able to successfully configure and build the project earlier on in the demo. Um, but just to show you how this works, let's add in another item to our dependencies list that I don't already have installed. Okay, so now if we run this command again, There, we see that it builds uh, the FMT package and it's using the cached binary package, which makes it faster and installs it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's as easy as that. So this is a really great new feature that we're excited about because it makes it really easy to just share this manifest file in your project. Um, and then anyone who's using this project can just run the VC package um, command from their command line and it will take care of installing all of the dependencies and configuring them with CMake. Um, it's a very automated, seamless experience and um, we're very excited about it. So I want to reiterate that one of the benefits of using VS Code and CMake and VC Package is that it allows you to configure your project in a way that uh, switching to a different platform is seamless. All of these tools work across Windows, Linux, and Mac. So I just showed you how it works on Windows. Now I'm going to use the VS Code Remote SSH extension to SSH into my Linux VM and show you that it works the same on Linux. I'm going to show you how to use the Remote SSH extension in VS Code to connect to a Linux VM. So the first thing you'll have to do is install the remote SSH extension from the extension marketplace. Once you do that, 
then you'll see this remote explorer icon on the left. So if I click on that, um, then I'm presented with a list of SSH targets that I have previously connected to through this remote SSH extension. Um, in this drop down, I can select between SSH, WSL, VS Online, containers. These are all different remote extensions in VS Code. And if you download the remote extension pack, then it will include all of these extensions with it. So I'm going to connect to uh, this host right here. Um, I could also add a new one by clicking on this plus sign, but uh, this one down here, this is where my SuperTux project is. So let's open a new window. All right, and you can tell that you are in your uh, remote window based off of this um, SSH target IP address in the bottom green corner. All right, so let's open a folder. And it's important to call out that the remote SSH extension in VS Code works differently than remote development in Visual Studio because all of my source files are already on my Linux VM. Nothing is copied over from my Windows laptop. So before this demo, I had connected to the Linux VM and cloned the SuperTux GitHub repository. So let's open that. All right. There we go. And you can see that IntelliSense is working properly on my Linux VM. So we can start by making sure that all of the project dependencies are installed on this VM by running the VC package install command. It has the VC package JSON manifest file right here. Let's all the dependencies. So all we need to do is run this command, VC package install binary caching from my project folder. And there we go, all of these packages are installed. So then we can just follow the same steps to configure the project using CMake tools. You'll notice that when I select a kit, these are all uh, compilers that are found on my Linux VM. So this time I am using GCC. So let's configure. And then we can build. And we can debug. And this time it'll use uh, GDB, which you can see right there, executing GDB. All right, so there we have it. It's all working properly on Linux, followed the same exact steps that I did on Windows, except that it's using GCC and GDB under the hood. So now you've seen how to successfully use VS Code, the CMake Tools extension, and VC Package to configure our SuperTux CMake project on all platforms. The takeaways from this demo are that VS Code, CMake Tools Extension, and VC Package are all tools that we recommend to ease your cross-platform development experiences. Additionally, you should use the VS Code Remote Extensions if you would like to develop for platforms other than your host OS. So now I'm going to dive into how VS Code can be used for collaborative development. VS Code has a live share extension pack which enables you to start live collaboration sessions directly in VS Code, directly in that text editor. So it makes it really easy for you and your teammate to quickly collaborate on the same code base because you don't have to worry about replicating code or adjusting configuration or environment settings. What happens is that your teammate actually sees a context of your workspace in their editor and they get all of the language features such as IntelliSense and go to definition, rename, and so on. So once you are both in the same collaborative session, you can both open files and navigate through the code, make changes, and these changes will be reflected in real time for both of you. 
And you can even do collaborative debugging sessions so that you can both independently use the debugger features, such as setting breakpoints or watching uh, local variables. So now I will give you a little demo of how the live share extension works. It's worth calling out that uh, normally it wouldn't be the same person joining the session from their computer and their VM. You would use this with a coworker or a class member or anyone that you trust, um, but it could be it could be any two machines, right? So in this in this demo, I will be using both of the machines, but um, if you're using this extension, it would likely be your computer and someone else's computer. So on the on my Windows laptop, I'm going to start my collaboration session. And uh, before recording this demo, all I did was install the Live Share extension pack on both my laptop and my VM. If the extension pack uh, has any OS specific dependencies that aren't already installed on your machine, VS Code will let you know and will give you the option to let it just install those for you and take care of everything. So on my Windows laptop, I will click on this live share icon on the left to open this live share pane. And then I can click uh, start collaboration session. And this will give me a URL that I can share with whoever I want. And uh, by using that URL, they can join the session from their own device. All right, so the invitation link has been copied to my clipboard. So now I'm going to go onto my VM and in the same live share uh, pane on the left, I'm going to click join collaboration session and then paste the URL for the session that I just started. Okay, so this is just joining the uh, live share session from my VM. It might take a moment since I'm doing this uh, remotely. There we go. So now you can see in my Explore on the Linux VM, I have this Visual Studio Live Share workspace, and it is loading the SuperTux project from uh, the collaborative session that I started on my Windows laptop. So now I can actually see uh, the cursor of where the other person in the collaborative session is. And if I highlight something, it will show up on that other person's screen. They'll be able to see how I'm interacting with the code. Uh, let's say we want to debug something together. I can start a debugging session. So let's do that. I'm just, I have my breakpoint set in main. We'll click debug. And you can see it launched the debugger in both my Windows laptop and my Linux VM. So here I can debug uh, with my coworker directly from my own instance of VS Code. As we wrap up our session today, I want to talk a little bit about what's coming next for VC Package and for the C++ extension in VS Code. So there are a few enhancements that we're currently working on for VC Package. The first is support for a manifest file, which is the vcpackage.json that I demoed for you today. We're also working on a first-class experience for managing private libraries with VC Package. Customers will also be able to bring in additional libraries outside of what's supported in the catalog. Uh, VC Package will use binaries to update rather than pulling from source every time. And we also will support versioning, which means you can specify exactly which version of a package you would like to use. So if your project has a dependency on an older version of a package, that's fine. You'll be able to use that. As for the C++ extension, we're currently working on support for Linux on ARM and ARM64 devices. 
We'll start by releasing IntelliSense modes for cross-compiling, and then we'll have the full remote development and debugging on the ARM experience. If you are interested in when these features are being released, uh, you can stay tuned to the C++ team blog. As I said, these are things that we are currently working on and planning for, so I don't have specific dates to give you today. So the best thing you can do is just check the C++ team blog for announcements of new features. And that is the link to the blog in the slide. Also, Please give us your feedback. The C++ extension, the CMake Tools extension, and VC package are all open source, which means you can find all of their repos on GitHub. We turn to our GitHub repositories frequently when we are uh, creating our roadmaps for new features. We check out the open issues pages on each of these repos and see which open issues have the most upvotes. And that tells us what our customers care most about. So I have the links to the GitHub repos on the slide. Please, if you have a bug or an issue, uh, check out the issues page and create an issue if you don't already see the one that you're looking for. Upvote feature asks that you care about so we know what to prioritize. And of course, feel free to contribute to the repositories yourself. We are always looking for contributors. All right, well, thank you for coming to my session and I'm excited to answer your questions in the live Q&A. Okay, thanks very much for that talk, Julia. Uh, since the live video Q and A's have been going uh, not very well, to put it lightly, we're just gonna use chat for the, the Q and A sessions now. So uh, please keep your questions coming. Uh, Julia will still be around. The rest of the, the team who've been answering the questions you've had so far will also be around for a bit longer. Uh, so yeah, please keep your questions coming. And the session after this, will be um, a talk about concepts with Gabby Dos Reis. So uh, please tune into that as well.
All right, you can keep your questions coming. Um, I'm going to switch back over to the schedule. The next talk is in about 45 minutes, and in this time I'm going to try and get some of the um, the videos we've already been showing uploaded, so that if you missed anything, you can go back and watch them. Uh, here's the schedule.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, for those who are just joining us, my name is Cy Brand. I am Microsoft C++ developer advocate. Uh, you can find me at Tartan Lama on Twitter, and I'm the host of this conference today. Uh, if you've been checking the chat, you might know that a couple of the videos have already been uploaded. Uh, my own talk, which was the, the first session of the day, and Nico and Huth's talk on uh, Visual Studio Online. So uh, you can go check those out. And uh, the other video should be going up either today or tomorrow. Uh, with that, our next talk is by Gabriel Dos Reis, and it is on um, concepts, specifically uh, use cases of concepts. And I hope you enjoy. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, this part of talk for C pure C++ 2020 uh, is about uh, how you can effectively use concept uh, in embedded programming or just a non-generic programming context. Um, so I'm going to talk about how you can lift uh, some structural constraints that are usually very far from time to compile time so you achieve uh, some uh, partial evaluation and and so you, you you take away things that are computed repeatedly at runtime you lift that compile time that becomes the job of a compiler so that you can only focus on what is actually essential at runtime so that is the focus of this talk uh, let's get started so let's get into it how would you pick safely at a table doing so with concept so imagine that you have a programming task where uh, you need to go through tables and when you go through a table you look at an entry and then you perform an action based on what you found at that entry in the table. Uh, here is an abstract representation of that scenario. We have a set of actions to take. So that set of actions is represented here by an enum class, a well-behaved enum, you know, zero, one, many. And then for each action, we read a script and then we perform something based on that script. So the code that run the script, we call that an actor. So in our situation here, where we have actions zero, one, and many, we have actors zero, actor one, and actor many. And the mapping from an action to an actor is a play, and, and, and we record all the plays in a table that we call action map, that has the structure of a key value pair. Uh, table you know the key here I will say is the action and the corresponding value will be the actor so uh, going through the table and performing an action is very simple basic programming task all we have to do is to carefully going through the table inspecting each entry and asking if what we found there is the action we're asked to perform. And if that is so, we just retrieve the corresponding actor and ask it to run the script and then return a value. If we didn't find anything, then we will return minus one to indicate error. As a matter of fact, if the actor also run into some trouble, it will return some numerical value to indicate error. Basic. Okay. Now, uh, 
uh, this code will run perfectly, will do what it's supposed to do. The additional concern here is that we want to perform these tasks while being efficient. So the first idea is to say, hey, these actions are actually numerical values, consecutive numerical values, and you're most likely to have as many actions as we have actors. All we need to do is to check that we have the action inbound, so it must be at least zero and must be less than many. And if so, then we retrieve the numerical representation of the action, use that to retrieve the corresponding entry in the action map table, ask the actor to run the script and return. This is close to optimal efficiency. And we might be tempted to say, hey, we're done. Let's go get uh, go home and, and have fun. Well, not so fast. What happens? If the action map, that table, that maps an action to an actor, happens to have a hold on the maintenance, someone remove, retires an action, or someone adds something that is not there. Well, uh, in that case, in the case there's a hole in a map table, we have a bound safety problem. Even though the action might be within bound of the number of actions, the numerical value may not be in bound in terms of the size of the table. So, boom, we get a problem. There are many ways of fixing this, and one that I want to show in this short presentation is how we can use concept to elegantly uh, solve that problem in a way that is reusable therefore generic so i guess the first question that will pop to mind is what are concepts the first order approximation is that a concept is a predicate over types and compile time value <coughs> so typically we will use concepts to express the expectations of a function template on its template argument. Okay, and this provides the bedrock of principled generic programming, structured generic programming, the way Alex Stepanov does it. Okay, which is very successful. Look at the STL and all the many libraries that have been modeled after the approach taken by Stepanov. Concept being predicates can be composed and are composed uh, via the conventional logical operators, conjunction, disjunction, and negation. The interesting thing they bring to the table is that they allow us programmers to express directly in code our intent. Okay, that gives you a better structure to code and relegates the hackery sphene stuff to, you know, places we don't want to hear them from again. And it allows us, language designer, to bring generic programming to the masses, to make generic programming looks like just programming. That has been one of the major goals behind concept. As a benefit of being disciplined, bringing structure to the programs, we get partial evaluation for free. I'm going to uh, explain what I mean shortly. But before that, how do you use a concept? Well, most of us will not have to define a concept. We will just use concepts defined by someone else. So C++20 comes with uh, some basic 
foundational concept. You find them in the standard header concept. Okay, you can use them to declare template parameters and place combined constraint on function template parameters. Okay, or if you within you know normal programming, you can use them to require some structural checking on the type of a local variable. Okay. And as an example here on the right side, I have a function that I want to use to compute the minimum number of bits required to express a natural number. So here I'll take unsigned int as a natural number or unsigned long or unsigned long long as a representation of natural number. Okay. And after that definition, where I have the template parameter T with the type of the value, here I'm declaring just like I'll declare normal uh, variable. Uh, I declare with uh, the concept unsigned integral. So unsigned integral is a standard concept. It is a predicate. Okay takes only one type parameter and check whether that parameter type is uh, an integral type according to the standard definition of integral type, unsigned integral type. So if I call a function length with uh, a manifestly unsigned integral, now the call will just succeed. If on the other hand, I tried with double the compiler like, yeah, I don't think that will work. Or if I try to call that function length with a manifestly negative number, we also get a feedback. No, can't do. Okay, so this brings additional type safety at the use sites of templates. Now, how do you go by defining your own concept. I will get there shortly, but do remember that concepts are compile time predicates. Now, in the context of the problems that we have, which is that we have a table that we want to ensure doesn't have a hole in it, all the entries are filled linearly from zero up to the end. There is no hole in between. I call that a retractable space. Okay. So the first thing you want to do is to define a compile time predicate that check for that property. So again, that predicate is take the table, go through it, and at in each entry, check whether the key is numerically the same as the action, the, 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 the position in, in, the, uh, in, in the table. If that is true, we're done. If that, then return false. Basic thing. So this function is declared const expert so that we can use it at compile time with compile time value, with a compile time table, okay? So if we only had C++14, we will actually say something like this. We will have our table, and then we will ask the compiler at top level, static assert, please verify that the action map table satisfies the predicate retractable by key. And given what we have, the compiler will go think about it and comes back to, yeah, I think that's, that's true. And now that we have that compile time predicate, we have statically verified the structure, the algebraic structure of the table. We can just go in the perform function, check that the runtime value of act is at least zero and less than the size of the table and use that numerical value to index into the table, retrieve the actor, run the script, and then return whatever is the outcome of the script. So 
We can express all this safely using generic programming techniques, but not concept to express this. So you will say, we're done. Why do we need uh, concepts? Is this just being fancy? Not exactly. One thing I want to uh, emphasize here is that this is just one um, table, action map. Usually you'll have many tables like these in, in, in structure. And you like to be able to ensure that when you, when you try to index into these tables, these properties of being retractable by key are automatically verified with that you having to uh, duplicate the static asset every time. It becomes tedious, right? So the, uh, the whole point of generic programming is being lazy, safe, and being lazy with class. Okay. So how can we go from this place where we are, which is a safe ground, to a, and a higher ground that requires less typing if the map, you happen to have many of them. So the way we do that is first by defining a concept, turning that um, predicate into a, a, a higher level uh, predicate that we call concept. So here we introduce the concept retractable by key. The declaration, the definition here looks like we have a template, but it is not a template. It is a concept. And we know it is a concept because we use the keyword concept. And the definition is by running this predicate, uh, tracking by key, it's function predicate, uh, tracking by key on the table, which is a template non type parameter. Okay. So once we have that, now we can abstract over the table that you now we're going to have an instance of in the program and have a function that retrieves the play entry from the table uh, by looking at the corresponding uh, action, right? So here the function template play entry has the usual template parameters, but additionally has this thing that we call the requires clause that says, oh, by the way, I do require that this compile time value table satisfy the predicate retractable by key. Okay, and once we know that, we will just take the numerical value of action look into that table that is provided as a template parameter and then return the corresponding entry. So this is basically where we wanted to go. It's almost there, except that that numerical value of action might potentially be as a bound. No problem. Um, when we get to actually call that function, we just assert that the value is indeed inbound. And then we call that function and then we're done. We're done because now we still retain the constant time, the near optimal efficiency while remaining safe, bound safe, memory safe. And we have done so by being completely agnostic of the kind of table. The only thing we need from the table is that it is retractable by key. And now any other table that has the same property, we can use the same function to retrieve the entry and perform the same kind of operation with optimal efficiency. So the summary of this technique is that you look at your code and look at what kind of structure does the data type, the data that I'm, modify, I'm playing with have, and then turn that into some kind of predicates that can be evaluated at compile time. And then abstracting over the specific data so that at compile time, you can perform an action only if the, uh, the guards, the, the predicate that guard the action is satisfied. So your compiler will never 
generate code for something that is faulty. So uh, just as a summary, this is where the left side is where we were. We have a linear search and the right side is where we ended up, where we move the structure of the table, the algebraic structure of the table into a predicate that the compiler can verify. And then we take the residual, which is the things that requires runtime value, and then only do that efficiently. We have removed the inefficiency. We have partially evaluated the algebraic structure of the table and of the computation, and then evaluates the compile time part of it and letting the residual to the runtime. So this, I hope you can generalize uh, to tables that are not just retractable by key, but have some other algebraic properties, like, you know, the entries could be strings and things are sorted by key. And, you know, you, only your imagination is the limit. However, what I want you to also retain is to use concept early, to use concepts often. Okay? Thank you very much for watching. Okay, so um, I hope you, you got the essence of this talk, which is when you're doing some computations that have structure, to them. they always do, you know, sometimes when it's not obvious, they always have structure to them. Please pay attention to that. Um, I hope you got the essence of the techniques and you're able to apply that to your day-to-day -day programming job. Um, I don't think of this as some kind of uh, cute uh, puzzles or brain teaser that make you look smart. I think of this as an effective technique that helps you to be more effective in your day-to-day -day job. Uh, please uh, go try it out. Download your favorite compiler. It could be MSVC, I would prefer, or GCC, or Klein. But please, please try it out and let me know. Uh, give me feedback and I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that talk. Uh, we've got a few minutes, um, about eight minutes until the next scheduled session on uh, modules. So if you'd like to ask any questions down in the chat, this would be the perfect time.
Okay, we're going to move on. If you have any other questions for Gabby, you can feel free to just send them down in the chat or uh, I can connect you later or you can you can email us. Our contact details are on the, the website. Uh, we're going to get started next on the, the penultimate session on um, practical C++20 modules and the future of tooling around C++ modules. Marshmallow hopes you enjoy. Hello, my name is Cameron DeCamera and I'm a member of the Visual C++ compiler team. I work on the C++ compiler front end and primarily in the area of implementing modules. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to leverage modules in projects and how to use them effectively. We'll also discuss some tooling aspects of a modules ecosystem towards the end. Without further ado, this is Practical C++ Modules. Let's start by breaking down the category of topics that this talk will not touch on. Uh, please note that this list is not a comprehensive one. Right off the bat, we're not going to discuss how to integrate modules into existing projects using a specific build system. The techniques I'm going to share here are going to pertain to source level transformations that one can apply which facilitate in organizing their code in order to take advantage of modules. Um, the next thing we're not going to talk about is how to deploy pre-built modules. This kind of falls under the umbrella of packaging and is a topic that will always have a solution specific to the project that you're working on. So let's get right into it. We'll first discuss the modules machinery included in C++20 at a high level. Then I'll get into our first demo portion where we, where we will use that machinery to help migrate a project. Uh, we'll gradually use more advanced techniques as we progress through that migration. And finally, we'll discuss tooling and the implications module has on the C++ ecosystem and beyond. So let's talk a little bit about C++20 exported translation units. I chose the wording of C++20 exported translation units very carefully. C++20 brings us some name module units, as a lot of people might know, um, but it also affords C++ with a more generalized notion of exported translation units, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit as we progress. Um, so we kind of have module units, which have two very common um, portions to them, which is primary module interfaces and module partitions. Finally, we have header units, which is the last form of an exported translation unit that C++20 gives us. So let's first talk about name module units. These have clear boundaries of API surface area exposed through various declarations marked as exported. The primary module interface are what make up the entirety of the entry point to this exposed API surface area. So if we were to break down a primary module interface, an example of one could be this. Um, where we have the primary module declaration at the top, export module M, and we're exporting this my type. We do not export the internal type, and then we export a function which accepts my type and just uses the internal type in its implementation. So the consumer of this module might just import it, use my type for some various operations, and then call the API that we expose through the export declaration F. Um, now, if you tried to use the internal type in the import side, you would res that would result in a syntax error because that name would just not be found by the compiler. It was not exported. The compiler on this side does not know about it. Module partitions are a specific type of interface which ultimately end up composing a single module interface. Module partitions provide the programmer with a new way of organizing their API in a logical way. This can be done for a multitude of reasons. One such reason possibly is to reduce compilation time in a rebuild scenario. Another reason might be to um, use partitions is to separate their interface into distinct pieces to help unglue certain dependencies. And I'll get into this a little bit later when we get into the demo portion of the talk. In this example, uh, we took the original primary module interface from before and separated it into two partitions. So we actually have the same API surface as before, except that we've made it clear to any contributor to the primary module interface that functions always go in the function partition and types always go in the types partition. 
And so the use of module partitions is the same as before. Um, again, as I mentioned, we had the same API surface. So to the end user, it looks exactly the same. They still import that module. Um, it's just the composition of that module is different under, under the covers. Which brings us to the last form of C++20 exported translation unit, header units. Uh, header units are really kind of just separately compiled header files. Um, and they, they act more like a formalized PCH. Header units export everything in its translation unit. And they also have the added ability to export macros. So a use of this might look like this. Um, and the syntax is actually very analogous to uh, hash include, where the argument name is a header name. Um, so you can have the quoted form, as I have here, or you can actually have the angle bracket form um, that you would see with a lot of the standard library headers. Um, and let's say this m.h uh, exports the same content, or it, it just has the same declarations as our um, original module interface. So we can use my type and we can use f. And if there were any macros defined in that header, um, we could also use them in this translation unit. Now that we know all the different types of exported translation units available to us, um, it's kind of a, it's important to know which ones will be easier to integrate than others. Uh, and I'm going to just go through the list of the different types of exported translation units in order of integration difficulty for projects. So the very first one is header units. Um, header units are very easy to integrate into most projects simply because they preserve all the macro state, they preserve all the declarations that were in that header. Um, you can almost do like a one-to-one -one transformation of hash include to import header unit. Um, so that one's, that one's fairly straightforward. Uh, the next one is primary module interfaces. Now because macro state doesn't come out of a module, a named module interface, um, these are a little bit more um, harder to define, especially because you now have the ability to restrict what API surface you offer all of your consumers. Um, so there's some cost benefit there. And finally, we have module partitions. Um, this is really just a refinement of the primary module interface. So as we, as we go from one to three here, um, we're descending from the largest API surface to the most narrow as we, dis as we descend into our uh, dependency chain for the project. So let's finally jump into the demo portion of this talk. So the tools we're going to use for this uh, demo portion are MSVC. Um, it's, this is an unreleased tool set. It's going to be sometime after 16.6. I'm going to be using VS Code as my main editor um, and Python 3 uh, for the latter half of this demo, uh, which is going to be really around tooling. Let's say that we've been provided this small library. In this library, we have collections of animals, collections of transports, some internal implementation details, and some algorithms that we can run on those types. The library author decided to use the std variant vocabulary type to get a little bit of runtime polymorphism over dog, cat, and horse for the animal section. In the transport section, we use that same vocabulary type to group car, plane, and animal horse together. And it's relevant that we reuse this animal horse type here because when we go to modularize this later, we'll actually have to import this type from a separate module, which we're gonna name animal. In here, we have some internal implementation details to the algorithm section. And these are not really meant to be used by the end user. It's really just used to implement details of the uh, algorithms themselves. And getting into the algorithms, we have this one question we can ask, which is, can this transport transport the given animal? So when we go to dispatch over this type, we have various cases. So a car cannot transport a horse. A horse is too big for a car. A plane cannot transport animals. And you can't put a horse on a horse, that's just silly. And finally, we have our catch-all case for everything else where this transport is capable of transporting the given animal. We finally have some two-string methods which do exactly what you would expect. It takes in a generic type dispatches on it and gives us a stringified version of that type. Over here in our main section, let's ignore this function for now. This function really is going to use that uh, algorithm that's provided to us for figuring out whether or not this transport is capable of transporting this animal and just print it out to the screen. So if we go to compile this, 
you'll see that we get some numbers here. We can compile this translation unit in about 1.5 seconds. And if we run it, it prints out all the various combinations that we have in our main here. So this is kind of C++ as we know and love it today. So let's say at some point later, the library author decides that they really don't want everything in one giant header file. And they think that splitting it up into multiple header files is a little bit more of a maintainable solution. Um, so one thing you can do in C++ today is do exactly that. So if we go into our collections header, um, let's go ahead and split up all of these different header files um, and separate our concerns a little bit. So we have one for animal, we have one for uh, transport, and we have one for the algorithms. Um, this is the exact same program semantically as before, just that uh, we, we've organized our code differently so that things are slightly more maintainable going forward. And in fact, we can compile this and you'll notice that the output time is roughly the same um, and it runs exactly the same as before. So we have the same program semantics. It's just we've organized our code a little bit better. So this is all well and good, but the problem is that all of the consumers of our library collections here are still gonna be paying that copy paste cost of all of those header files. So things like collection animal and std variant, all that stuff is gonna be compiled into every translation unit that depends on collections. So C++20 gives us the first mechanism we can use and leverage to move our code into kind of a modular world. And the first thing that we're gonna to try to integrate is header units. So this is what integrating header units into your program might look like. You'll notice that the only discernible difference between this main and the last one is that we've changed the hash include preprocessor directive into an import directive. Likewise, everything in our uh, library has changed from hash include to uh, import directives. So collections.h, um, transport, and algorithms. So if we build this now, we can't just build the main by itself anymore. We have to build all of these header files separately. Um, they're separately compiled translation units. So first we build all of the headers, and then we can actually build our main now. You might notice our time went down a little bit here. Um, and in fact, if you were to benchmark where the time is being spent now, it's actually up here in this include IO stream. Now we could move this into our collections.h, but we don't want to have uh, all of IO stream be included in collections.h. That seems like a pretty big hammer to impose on all of the consumers of our library. So for right now, we're just gonna keep it outside of our header unit collection. Um, and if we were to run this now, we do get the same output as before. So, as I mentioned before, header units are kind of the easiest thing to start integrating into projects right now. The barrier to entry is really low because they preserve all of the macro state, they preserve every declaration that's in your header files. All you really have to do is make your header files a standalone translation unit. They have to compile. Uh, that's that's the bare minimum requirement for header units. So let's see if we could possibly move this thing into more of a named module unit. So this is kind of what our main program looks like after we've integrated uh, named module units now. The only thing that's really changed is uh, the import declaration this time. And it's now naming our named module interface. And if we look at the contents of this thing, the very first thing you might notice is this section up here. Uh, between the module semicolon and the export module collections, this area is what's known as the global module fragment. And I like to think of this area is as, uh, this is kind of where your third party code goes. Uh, STL headers, boost headers, that kind of stuff are all great candidates to put in this section. And anything in this section will not be exported by the module, it's just used really for implementing the details of your of, of your APIs. So as we take a look at this module interface now, you might notice that it has kind of a very similar shape to the original header file that contained all of this library in one file. And that's that is something we will touch on in in just a little bit, but for now, 
uh, let's focus on what is actually happening here. So you might see all of these export uh, keywords here. These are what actually end up creating the API surface of this named module collections. Everything that has an export on it will be exported and observable from outside the module. You'll see that this collections internals is not exported. So if I tried to use this type on the import side, the compiler would complain and say that it cannot find it. And we'll see an example of that in just a bit. Everything else is exactly the same as it was before. So if we go back to our main now, the way we compile this is very similar to the header unit. We have to build the module first, and then we can build our main. And we actually get a very similar time to what the header unit had. And we're going to address that really quickly right now. So you may recall that before we didn't actually want to include IOStream in our original header unit because that means that anybody who included that header unit collections.h would also get IOStream. That's not something that we wanted to impose on any of our users. So with module with named module units, we actually get an opportunity to hide IOStream as an implementation detail of these two APIs. So what we can do here is we can actually take these two APIs and put them into our named module down here, into the algorithm section. Add IOStream into the global module fragment. We can now delete it from up here. Since we have put those APIs in the algorithms namespace, we're gonna have to add this. And we can rebuild our module rebuild our translation unit and now we have some really significant speed up and in fact the program runs exactly the same as it has before but we can rebuild this in a tenth of the time that it took to build the original version So you recall me mentioning that modules can be used to hide implementation details of our APIs. So if we tab back over here to our interface file and we scroll down back to this internal section, you'll see that this overloaded type is not exported. So in my main, if I try to use that, uh, all this type does is really accept a series of lambdas and create an overload set object out of them. If I try to build this, the compiler will error out and say it doesn't know about this overloaded name. It, 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 it doesn't, it, it was never exported from the interface. So the compiler simply doesn't know about it on this side. So now that we've talked a little bit about uh, primary module interfaces, let's talk a little bit about what it looks like to integrate module partitions into a project. So this is what it looks like to integrate module partitions into a project. None of our main has actually changed. It's even the same, it could even be the same file. Uh, but underneath, how our module interface is composed has actually changed quite a bit. So if we look at what our interface looks like now, at the top level, all you see is the collections module interface declaration, and then we import export all of the partitions that compose this API surface. So if we peek into animal, for example, you see, it looks just like a module interface, except that it has this new syntax, which tells the compiler that this is a module partition, and we export it as we did in the primary module interface. Similarly, transport has the same thing, but whenever we import another partition, uh, if we're in the same module unit, we can actually just use this syntax to import a separate partition that's part of the same module and we get access to animal horse in this way. Algorithms, since it uses both of these module partitions, imports them both. And algorithms is largely the same as before. And as before, we have moved these two functions into the algorithms. So now that we have these module partitions, we actually build it uh, similarly to how we built all those header files before, we need to sequence them. So if we go through and we build the module, 
And the reason we have to build them in a specific order is because some of the interfaces depend on each other. And then we finally build the main as before. We get very similar speed ups that we saw with just the primary module interface. And in fact, we can run this and it has the same output. So we have not changed the program semantically from the very beginning. So you may be asking yourself, why would we go through the process of converting all of these modules into partitions? Uh, what does that actually gain us? Well, from an organizational point of view, you actually get the ability to uh, very specifically tell users of your libraries and contributors where to find things and where to put things. Uh, but another thing, and I mentioned this before, is that it can actually contribute to build throughput wins in rebuild scenarios. So I'm going to go ahead and go and add an extra API to just the algorithms partition. And we're going to rebuild just that partition and see if we can get some output. Okay, so now that we have just that algorithm, we're going to include IOStream up here again. And we're gonna to try to use it. So now all we should be able to do is rebuild just the algorithms header, or the interface, and build our prim primary main. And now we can run it, and we'll see the output of one here, because a horse is a horse, of course. Now the reason this actually works in the MSVC compiler is because we adopted a by reference model for referencing partitions and other module units. So this means that whenever you whenever you import a module into another module, all of the declarations from the imported module don't actually get uh, shoved into the module that you're creating. It actually references the other module on disk. So it loads them dynamically as it needs them. There is one last thing I wanted to mention before we depart from this example, and that is the inclusion of IOStream up here. You might recall that in the algorithms partition, we actually included IOStream in the global module up here, but that doesn't actually mean that it's IOStreams are accessible from outside the module. They're still, they're, they are still not considered to be part of the API surface of that module. So we put our global module up here again, we import our module and now we can use stdc out here as it is used inside the module within this result API. So all of the techniques I've shown so far work really well with toy projects, but what happens if we try to apply them to a real world code scenario? So what I've done here is I've gone out and I've cloned the I am GUI uh, repository from GitHub. And all I've done is set up a basic VS Code experience so I can build the library and I can build their DirectX 12 example that they provide. So let's go ahead and do exactly that. And build the application. And we can actually run this. You can see this works exactly like you would expect. So our goal right now is to just see if we can apply header units to this project right now. Um, and the very first thing I like to start by doing is uh, creating what I like to call a bridge layer between the DirectX 12 headers and the rest of the application, just the library portion. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so this application should build exactly the same as before. And we can run it again. Cool. 
One reason I really like these bridge files is that they kind of help you separate um, the parts of your API from the system API. I use them a lot when uh, writing my own personal projects. And they're, they're really mostly personal preference and not necessary for this demo. Uh, but they kind of make, make grouping all of those APIs a little bit easier when we go to make a header unit out of those things. So let's actually go through the process of replacing all of these hash include preprocessor directives into import directives throughout uh, just the parts of the application, not the library. Now it's important to note that when we actually go to build these headers, we have to build them in a specific order because um, as you can see, most things depend on DX Bridge and DX Bridge can be built all by itself. And I am GUI can be built all by itself. Essentially any of the library headers can be built by themselves. The ones that we need to actually depend on are uh, the I'm GUI impl win32.h and the I'm GUI impl directx12 uh, .h, which both depend on I'm GUI.h. So we have to sequence the build in that way. So now that the build steps are in place to build the library, then build the headers, and then build the application, we can go ahead and do exactly that. So if we build the library first, this build should be exactly the same as before. Then we can build our headers. And now we can finally build our application. And just to see, we can run it again, and we get the same output. So that is kind of a very brief overview of how to uh, translate something, translate a project just using uh, header units. Now, if you wanted to use module implementa or module units, uh, that process is slightly more involved. And as we've seen, it can take quite a bit of time uh, to figure out exactly what API surface you want to uh, expose to all of your customers or any consumer of your library. Just as another quick test, uh, I set up an example where we are using the header units and a case where we're not using the header units, we're using traditional hash include. Um, and we're just gonna see the compile time throughput difference between these two scenarios. So without modules, we can build this translation unit in about 1.2 seconds. With modules, or with header units, I should say, we build this translation unit in about a tenth of the time. And that's pretty essential when you're talking about more of a REPL type development cycle and giving developers more power when they just want to iterate very quickly on a problem. And again, this promotes the idea in C++ that you pay for what you use. And in this case, in the case of header units and in the case of modules, you're paying um, a cost which is directly proportional to the number of names and to the names that you use inside of your module. Okay, so let's quickly hop back to our overview page and talk a little bit about tooling while we have some time. Um, so back in 2017, uh, Gabriel Dosre, he published a paper called Modules are a tooling opportunity. And in this paper, he discussed the idea of having a proper semantic representation of a C++ program. Now, since then, um, Microsoft's uh, compiler, MSVC, we have adopted the IFC format, which is our module BMI on disk. And this is spiritually a successor of the IPR work that came out of Gabby and uh, Viarne. And really the goal of this work was to create a proper semantic representation of a C++ program internally in the compiler. Now, what happens when we actually persist that semantic representation on disk and what does it look like? Well, in reality, it's just a graph. So you can take this left-hand side over here and persist it out to disk and you might get a graph that looks something like this. And you can see all the names that Invoker depends on. You can see a whole uh, bunch of other rich information that you can get from our IFC format. 
So what can we actually do with it today? What I have here is a very basic example of using the SDL library. And SDL is a C-based graphical API that has been around for quite some time. It's pretty mature. Um, and this particular version is actually uh, no longer available, 1.2. Um, but what I have done is I've created a module out of this thing, or I have created a header unit out of the SDL.h. And I just took one of their basic examples and um, made it compile. So let's see what the output of this thing looks like. Right. So you get a very basic image to the screen. Now, the most interesting thing here is that we end up with this artifact on disk, the, the header unit for SDL.h. And let me show you something that might be a little bit surprising. On the right hand side here, we have some Python code. And you might even say that this Python code looks very similar to the SDL code that we have on the left-hand side. And that is by design. And what I have done here is I've created this uh, FFI library, which will take and consume the IFC format that we have on disk, translate it to some FFI wrappers for SDL, and invoke the SDL APIs. So let's go ahead and run this wrapper and just see what happens. So the easiest way to invoke this is to just run Python over it and you provide the um, IFC that you have on disk to it. And we get the same output as the C++ program because really it's just using the DLL underneath. And, and just to prove that I'm not pulling your leg, I'm gonna make this window super wide just to see what happens. So let's rerun it and we get an overly wide window. So the thing that really made what I just showed possible is the fact that we have a formalized IFC specification. And this specification is, again, derivative of IPR. So if you're familiar with IPR, the data model that supports it, you're gonna be familiar with the IFC specification. And what all we did in the Python example is we traversed the BMI that was on disk, the IFC, and looked for functions that we could generate FFI wrappers in uh, using Python C type library. So the other thing about this IFC that you should know is that it's all 32-bit addressing. So if you build an IFC on a 32-bit machine, you can actually take that IFC and put it on a 64-bit machine and compile some C++ translation unit using that IFC. So you can move it from machine to machine. It's independent in this way. And finally, the IFC spec will be open source. So the tooling opportunities will be available to the wider community, not just people who work for Microsoft, for example. So what kind of conclusions can we draw from all this modules information, all of the uh, possible scenarios that we can apply modules in and the C++ 20 machinery that comes behind it? Um, I think the, the, one of the primary takeaways is that moving to modules is always going to be an iterative process. It's not going to be something that happens overnight. Um, and the other thing to acknowledge is that build systems will catch up, I promise you. <laughs> um, modules are certainly worth the effort. And it's going to bring a whole new generation of tooling opportunities. And tooling opportunities that we probably couldn't even think of 10 years ago, five years ago even. And it's just, it's an exciting time for C++. It's an exciting time for compiler developers. And it's even an exciting time for developers to see what people are going to come up with. I wanted to finish with some acknowledgments. I wanted to first thank Cody Miller, who initially came up with the idea of creating the FFI wrapper uh, based on the IFC format. And I wanted to thank Gabby, who provided a lot of good guidance and input into good modules practices, which helped me ultimately form this talk. And I also wanted to thank everybody here. Uh, thank you for joining me um, on this sort of small journey in exploring modules. And I would like to invite anybody in the YouTube comments section who's watching this live right now uh, to ask me, ask my future self some questions. Um, challenge me. And thank you again for joining me. Okay, thanks for that really great talk, Cameron. Um, we'll now have Al. 
some questions. So um, you can send your questions to chat and uh, we're a little bit over time, but I certainly don't have anywhere else to be. So we'll have some time for questions and then a break before our final session on um, MSBC's STL implementation.
All right, Cameron and Gabby might be around for a bit longer to answer questions, but feel free to take a break and we'll get started again in about 20 minutes. Uh, also, Erica's video from this morning, which is the third session, has now been uploaded and we're going to get through um, the rest of them hopefully by the end of tomorrow. So any sessions you've missed, you'll be able to catch up on. So we'll go back to the session and I'll see you in about 20 minutes.
Okay, thanks everyone for for tuning in and staying with us. Uh, we're now ready for the final session of the day, um, presented by Mahmoud, who is going to talk about our implementation of the C plus plus twenty standard library. Uh, if you've been with us the whole time, thank you very much. If you've just been joining us for a few talks, that's great too. Uh, after this, I'm going to link to a survey, which it would be amazing if as many of you as possible could fill it in, so that we know what went well, what didn't go well, apart from you know the obvious audio issues. Um, so that if we try something like this again, we can make it the best that we can. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this last session, uh, and I'll see you afterwards. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Mahmoud. I'm a software engineering manager at Microsoft, currently leading the Microsoft Visual C++ Libraries team. Our team is responsible for Microsoft's implementation of the standard C++ library. I'm here today to talk to you about the progress we have made so far towards implementing the latest C++ standard, aka C++20. I will be talking a little bit about MSVC SCL, then go into more details talking about what have been completed so far, what we're currently working on, and what's next, of course. Also, I want to tell you about a major change we have made in the way we develop the C++ library. We have recently moved our development to open source, so I would like to talk a little bit about that as well. Microsoft's implementation of the C++ library, also sometimes known as STL, is the version of the C++ library created for Windows. Most Windows C++ applications and libraries, and even Windows itself, are built on top of MSVC STL. The STL is designed to be used with other components of the Microsoft Visual C++ toolset including the compiler's front-end and back-end. However, we also support other compilers, including but not limited to Clang and Edge. As many of you may already know, the SCL library is released as part of Visual Studio, and it also integrates really well with the Visual Studio tools, such as the VS Debugger. Also, the SCL is fully compliant with C++ standards, for example, last year we have completed the implementation of the C++17 and since then and even before that we have been implementing C++20 features. Now I'd like to use this opportunity to talk to you about the move to open source development on GitHub. Last year, specifically at the same time as CPCon 2019, we have announced our move to open source development. Moving to GitHub does not mean we would reduce or have reduced our contribution to SCL's implementation. On the contrary, we are putting in a lot more resources to support this transition, and we will continue to implement C++ standard features as we've always been doing. So why really did we choose to open source the STL? First and foremost, we wanted to get closer, really close to our customers, as well as the C++ community. With the move to open source, SCL users will no longer need to wait weeks or months to get fixes to their bugs, or find out if their favorite new features have been implemented. They will be able to track all development in real time. Even more, many will find it easier to file and track issues on GitHub, since both the issues and the code live in the same place. But that's not all. We wanted to make it even easier for us to contribute back to other open source libraries out there. For example, we are currently in the process of contributing CarConf to lib C++. There's also the aspect of code quality. With more eyes and more developers contributing to the code base, we know that MSVC SCL will become even more robust. Finally, with open, with the open source license we have in place, we are welcoming code contributions from the C++ wide community, which will 
and already did have a significant positive impact on the rate of implementing C++ features. So what exactly have we open sourced on GitHub? The SCL, okay, let me bring my laser pointer. So the SCL, which is this part here, is what we have open sourced. The SCL is part of a larger set of libraries that work together to make the C and the C++ runtime. The SCL depends on the VC runtime, this box here, as well as the Windows SDK Universal CRT, sometimes known as the UCRT. This picture here is also available on GitHub, and you can take a look there as well. Let me talk a little bit about that, about each of the boxes here. The VC runtime, together with a static component VC, start, VC startup, are part of the MSVZ toolset, and they ship with Visual Studio. They provide the compiler mechanisms such as global variables constructors and destructors, as well as the exception handling machinery, among other stuff. The UCRT, Universal CRT here, is part of the operating system. It provides a C library support, including functions such as printf, memory allocation, and so forth. It also serves as a shim on top of other Win32 APIs, such as those used for open, fopen, and other uh, functions in the CRT. The SCL here is made of the headers, libraries, and when built, the binaries making the C++ standard library. At this time, only the SCL is open source. However, we are hoping to open source additional libraries in the future, but we don't have any current plans yet. So, what is the work we have completed so far to create a GitHub repo? Here's a quick overview. First, of course, we had, like any other company, we had to get approval to open source the STL, which we've done. Once we got that, we immediately got working on cleaning our sources, organizing everything for open source. We also created CMake build scripts, moving from the internal MS build project system we had before. Then, we set up build agents using Azure pipelines to ensure there are no build issues in pull requests submitted, and also as part of our CI. The latest thing we have accomplished was moving our test infrastructure to the open as well, which enable us to detect runtime issues and ensure the code quality is never degraded by PRs coming in. So what are we going to do after that? We have a roadmap. That was on github.com Microsoft SCL wiki roadmap. First, we would like to finish migrating all of our existing bugs. We would like all the SCL issues to be in one place for us and everyone else to easily track. So we want to move those bugs from our internal databases to GitHub. And we, are, uh, we have started doing that and we will continue to do that. Also, there are still some parts of the SCL that don't currently build with CMake and the repo, specifically the CLR components. We will fix that, and we will, con we will continue co uh, to uh, have everything uh, implemented, or actually uh, build build by CMake. Of course, our main target has and will continue to be focusing on completing the C++ standard implementation, C++ 20 implementation. This one here. Finally, we have set a goal for ourselves to, to meet the process of merging the code from GitHub repo to Visual Studio. So that process will be faster and less error prone. Now I'd like to take a minute to talk about the license we have in our GitHub repo. The license we have chosen, chosen is Apache version 2 with LLVM exceptions. Some of you may already know, or may have guessed from the name of the license, that this is the same one that's used by LLVM. We have chosen the license for several reasons, including its openness. So we won't limit our ability to port code to and from other open source repos, such as C++, for example. However, 
This comes as a cost. The cost for having such an open license is that it prevents us from accepting code provided under less open licenses, such as copyleft ones. That may seem that may somewhat limit what we can accept. Another reason for open source for using uh, the Apache LLVM with exception for open source is that it has a specific clause that allows applications and libraries using the STL, the binary ones, to be distributed in binaries without any attribution. That ensured existing customers didn't have any disruption and didn't need to change the way they ship their products. Here's a look at that part of the license on GitHub repo. So this one is available in our GitHub review at uh, master license text, license or text. So this is the last section that in that license. As it says here, embedded into our object form, which really means binaries, you may redistribute such embedded portions in such object form without complying with the conditions of Section 4A, 4B, 4D of the license. That's a lot of legalese, but really Section 4A, 4B, and D talk specifically about software redistribution, which basically mean enabling anyone using the STL to embed uh, or, or use the binaries created from the SCL without having to comply with the attribution clause. Of course, software uh, or uh, other libraries that derive from the STL or any code that derive from the STL will still need to continue to comply with those sections. So attribution is required. So next, to track all the code contributed to the repo, we have created a change log. Here, that's github.com Microsoft SCL wiki change log. The change log outlines all the features implemented and bugs fixed and shows the corresponding VS updates where each, has, each feature or bug fix has either shipped or if it's new code, it's going to plan to be the, the VS update where it will be planned to be shipped. We don't include the features implemented prior to open sourcing GitHub in that change log. However, those can be found on docs.microsoft.com right here. So this is a nice graph. This graph shows the progress made so far in implementing C++ standards. It shows both C++ 17 and C++ 20. Also, it shows bugs and LD, LWG issues we have been uh, fixing. The highlighted line here, the orange one, together with the right axis here, tells us the number of C++20 library features that have been either accepted or, and implemented. Each of the jumps here is a result of more features voted in at the various WG21 meetings. While drops like this one or this one, really means that those have been implemented. As of today, there are 32 features remaining, representing approximately 30% of the total features voted in. C++17, the green line here, was mostly done around March-April time frame uh, of uh, 2018 except for the elementary string conversion, also known as CarConf, which has been completed in August of last year. The red line here represents all the bugs that we still have. As I mentioned earlier, not all bugs are in GitHub yet, but we are working on that and we will be, ha we will be having everything on GitHub soon. Finally, the blue lines shows the progress towards implementing or fixing the LD LWG issues in our code base. So what have we, what features have we implemented? These are the features that have been completed prior to moving to GitHub. So together here, this shows the VS update, each of the features have, uh, have been implemented in. Uh, the VS update that those features have been implemented in. Okay. 
for example, actually all of them are C plus 20 except the first one C plus 17. So like I mentioned, elementary string conversion has been the last C plus plus 17. We have started development around VS 2017-15 or we have started releasing C plus plus 20 features around VS, uh, VS 2017 15.7 uh, update. And since then we have been working on implementing C plus plus 20 features. VS 2019 update 16.5 is the first release to contain community contributed STL features. These are all the features contributed to STL GitHub repo that have shipped with VS 2019 16.5. I guess that's about two dozens or so. In addition to the proposed paper, the table contains the GitHub. This is a paper here where each feature uh, that each feature implements. And here's who has contributed those features. Some of the features have been contributed by MSVC uh, team, by the MSVC team and others by uh, uh, and others by uh, external contributors. For example, CH Bartu is Charlie, he's on our team, Superwig, Nathan, they are all not uh, not on our team directly, but have been contributing to C++. Okay. The last column here is the issue. So GH9 really means the issue number, issue number 9 on the GitHub repo. Uh, by the way, these slides are going to be shared, and I'll be showing the link to where these slides are going to be shared at the end of this talk. All these are linkable. All these links are uh, clickable, so you'll be able to follow the links showing the PRs when you click on the contributor here, or the issue explaining more about what this feature implements. And these are all the features that have shipped in 16.6. All of those have also been implemented in GitHub. At the time of this talk, 16.6 is still in preview. So to get access to those features through Visual Studio, you will need to download the latest preview. Again, I'm going to show you links where you can download the preview if you don't already know that. Finally, we know that some features won't make it to 16.6. So they, we have started accumulating those in 16.7. So these are all the SCL GitHub features that are planned to go in 16.7 when the first preview ships. Of course, 16.7 haven't even started. It will start soon, so more expected to be added to 16 in the 16.7 time frame. So the features I've been talking about are all those that we have together with the community implemented. Okay. So what's left? Here are all the features left, around 30 plus features, okay. representing about 30% of the library. Based on the current PRs in the pipeline on GitHub and the number of contributions made so far, including by the MSVC team and everyone else, C20 features will probably be implemented or completed by early next year. That's, that's a very good guess. Hopefully, it will be done by then. Now I'd like to highlight some of the important C20 and one C++17 feature that we have implemented together with the community. In the next slides, I'll be talking about each of those. Also, I'll be demonstrating each one in code. Okay. The first one I'd like to highlight is contains for ordered and unordered associative containers. Contains for order and order service containers is one of the features that probably should have been added long time ago. As they make writing a Z contains function make writing lookup code much easier, especially for newcomers to the C++ programming language. It provides a much simpler alternative to more complicated and non-obvious code, such as the one presented here. I'll give you a minute to look at this code and then I'll move to the next, I'll move to the demo. Or the next slide, actually. 
So this table uh, from cpreference.com, which I'm sure most of you know about already, shows which containers have implemented contains the function contains in C++20. This highlighted box here. So these are all the associative and uh, ordered and unordered associative containers. List, set, multi-set, and so on. Next, let's look at a quick demo of contains. Okay, the first demo we have is for associative containers, contains. We have here very two simple examples on how to use contains. The first one is for a set, which is an ordered, and the second one is unordered map contains them. Here we have an array of numbers, and we are going to look uh, look for a separate, uh, specific key in that array. Similarly, in the unordered map, we have pairs that we are going to look into for a specific key. So, the first one, we will be looking for 10 and 30. Of course, 30 is not there, but 10 is. Similarly, 10 and 30 is the second one, which is an ordered map. Let's look at an example. Okay, so this was our test here. 10 found, yes, 30, no, 10, 30, no. Okay, let's go back to slides. Another feature that I'd like to talk about is starts with and ends with for strings and string views. As the name says, starts with and ends with is probably self-explanatory. It looks for uh, a string and, and, tell, and uh, provide a boolean that says whether start with a string starts with a given string or another string ends with a given one. It works for both basic string and string view. Similar to contains, those are functions that makes writing C++ a lot easier. I'm not really sure if we're going to see more string helps in the future, but this is a good start, and I'm sure it would be nice to see more. Let's quickly demo it, uh, starts with and ends with. Continuing the trend of functions that simplify programming, especially for newcomer to the newcomers to the programming language, we have uh, starts with and begin with. I have two demos here, one for string and one for string view. So in both demos, we will be in both examples here, we will be looking for a string, and in some of those cases, we will find it, it starts with and, and other cases we want. For example, here, C20 demo, does this start with C? We'll see if it's true or false. It starts with Java, probably not, so we'll see that. Similarly, as with demo, of course, demo is different from the small letter demo, is different from capital letter demo. So, second example, we will be looking at string view. It is the same, it's almost the same example. So let's look at it here. Okay. So the C20 demo starts with C++? Yes. Demo starts with Java? False. And continue. We could also search for a car rather a character rather than a string. So that works as well. Okay. And the second demo has the same things work for it as well. Okay. Let's go back to slides. This proposal introduced a new type, char8 underscore t. I'll just be calling car8t for now. I don't really know the right pronunciation, but car8t sounds good. The new type introduced solves a gap in the library. C11 have added UTF8, UTF16, and UTF32 string literals. Also, new types car16t and car32t were added for UTF16 and UTF32 respectively. But no new type was added specifically for UTF-8, until now at least. So, in addition to the new car-8 type introduced by this proposal, 
The proposal has added the necessary machinery for it to work with other types and algorithms, including a new US string alias and a new file system pass constructor with char 80. Uh, char 8t. The following demo shows how to use a new type. Let's take a look at the char 8t demo here. One of the first things I want to point out, because this is not standard, is because I am going to print, we are going to print uh, UTF-8 characters outside the ASCII that are non ASCII. Uh, then I would need to set the mode. I would need to first of all to print them in white car, and then I would need to set the mode for the console stood out to be UTF-16, which will allow us to print white car strings in Windows. Similarly, because I can print directly uh, ASCII characters, I will need something or UTF-8 U8 strings directly to the console. I'm going to be converting them to W strings using multi-byte white car Win32 API. And this will going to be a helper, uh, a helper function used throughout the sample code. I'm pointing those out because these are two are non-standard. And in case you want to use that code for anything other than Windows, uh, you need to replace them with something else. Okay. The first part of the sample is a general use case. Here I demonstrate the usage of algorithms such as starts with, and these are two different ways that I can pass a U8 string either directly from studio string alias uh, string or as conscar U8 uh, conscar 8 uh, uh, pointer here. And the first one I'm using actually the actual characters that are passed here that are inside uh, the search string. But in the second one, they are a bit different. They don't have all the accents on the T and I here. So let's see what will happen when I search for those. Okay. Also, the other part of the example is about hash. So it tries to compare UA strings to white car strings, the hash functions for those. Let's see if they are going to be the same or different for the same strings. First of all, as expected, it was able to find the characters with accent, the strings that have the same accents as the U string, but not the ones that have no accents here. Also, as we found out, that the hash for the U8 string is different than the one for the white car string. Here, they are different. Okay. Now let's take a look quickly at path. So path here is had a few uh, changes. First of all, the U8 path has been deprecated. If you build that, you will get the warning here with the deprecation that has been added to the library. Also, another constructor to path has been added, which uses a US string here. Okay. And then let's try to run that and see if the components of the path are going to be displayed correctly or not. Yep, here we have them. So everything, some file and some accents, yep, we have it. And the file name was correctly uh, specified together with a relative path and the extension. I believe that will be very helpful, especially in Windows where we have lots of uh, paths that are not um, that are not in ASCII only. B0919 has added heterogeneous lookup to unordered associative containers. Those are the list, set, and map, as well as a multi-set and multi-map. So what does that do? It improves the lookup performance when different but compatible types are provided for the lookup. With this proposal, there is no need to create a temporary or a copy of the key object passed to the lookup functions. The new behavior is similar to the ones that are already in ordered containers. Let's take a look at the code. 
In the heterogeneous unordered lookup demo, we have two examples, one for an ordered map and another for an ordered set, set. We also have structs that are going to be used for the template arguments. I made a note here about the second one. It's not strictly required uh, after a refinement to the proposal, so it can be replaced with something like std equal to. Here we have an unordered map and uh, uh, with with uh, with a pairs here, here to string and int, and we are going to look for the key in each of them, one time using the same type which is a string, another time using uh, a different kind which is a different type which is a string view. In, uh, prior to C++20, that will not work. However, in C++20, we can actually use those alias type in unordered, in unordered uh, heterogeneous, in unordered um, containers, uh, mainly because of this proposal. Let's have a demo, quick one. Okay. So here we look for apples, which is an unordered map. So that was a string found. Vegetable is a string view, could not be found. Our banana was a string view, and that was found with no, with, with no issues. Oranges, which is a string, it could not be, it actually was found. Okay. An order set is almost the same, so I'm not going to go, to go through that example. Karkov, or elementary string conversion. This is the only C++17 feature we will be looking at today. As you know, it's also the last feature we have implemented in C++17. Elementary string conversions add two new functions from cars and to cars in, Karkov, in the Karkov header. Those functions are used to convert between strings and numbers. The rationale behind introducing those functions is, over, is to overcome the shortcomings of existing ones primarily in terms of performance. All existing functions, example sprintf and a2i and a2l, take into account locale and in some cases string formatting, which result in a performance hit for most of those, especially when we don't need to do any string formatting or where locale is not needed. From cars and to cars are non-throwing and locale independent, and thus can provide significant performance improvements when string conversion from and to numbers is needed. Moreover, MSVC's implementation of those functions the STL is based on Ruse algorithm. It's much more optimized than whatever we had before for existing functions, and which have given us has given us quite a lot of performance improvement. Stefan's talk here about Carcom during last year's CVCon has a lot more details. So if you haven't watched it, I'd encourage you to do so. Here's a demo for Carcom. Okay, so Carcom demo, or as is known in the proposal, elementary string conversion. So here we are going to straight two functions, two cars, and from cars. First one, it basically converts from a number, a numeric value, into a string. Two cars requires that you provide uh, the size of the string through the first and last. and uh, it's going to convert it based on the input. So sometimes you can provide something like the base, for example. By default, we are base 10. However, we can do something like provide base 16 for hex. Okay, or base 2 for binary. Of 
course, it can also also do uh, floating point numbers. And you can even specify different notation, for example, scientific notation for your output, as well as the precision used for that scientific notation. There are various options, so I'm going to run it now. Okay. No surprises here. The first one is an int value, hex, or regular base 10 value, hex, binary. You could have specified, of course, some uh, uh, precision for that uh, floating point number, but we didn't, so it uses the default. And finally, the scientific one was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 precision. Okay. So AC, there's the error code. In all those cases, you couldn't find any errors, so it just returns zero. From cars, as you expect, it's just the opposite. For simplicity, we will be using the, the, the input array to convert from string to uh, a numeric value. And we're going to, in each of those cases, we're going to print that numeric value. We're also going to print the result, similar to the two cars demo. And we'll see. Um, let's see how that will work. It's worth noting that at the end, I'm adding an input which is not valid, and val cannot be translated into, a num into any numbers. So we're expecting it to be, uh, to at least output something that says this is not valid. Okay. Okay. So from cars, so, okay, 2020, 3.14, 120,000, 12 each part four, it printed the hex, the, the decimal representation of that hex value. Yeah, actually, this one. Similarly, it printed the decimal representation of that binary value. And finally, okay, the last one is e3, which is equal to e inval, which is an invalid uh, input. Let's go back to the slides. So starting with update 16.5, Visual Studio has started including community contributed code from GitHub. This feature has been contributed by Superwig. The link above is for support request for that contribution. Thank you, Superwig. The new arrays and erase functions are part of the library fundamentals TS. Remove and remove if have existed in the SCL for a very long time. And they certainly can help with erasing elements of the container. However, as highlighted by the paper, the correct pattern for calling remove and remove if, that pattern is not always followed correctly. Arrays and erase if help erase those common mistakes. The proposal contains an in-depth explanation for why that happens. So I'm going to leave to you as an exercise to read more why arrays is sometimes a better option. Here's a demo of the new functions. In this demo, I'm going to show the new functions studio arrays and studio arrays if. We have one example for each. You also have a couple of helper functions to print the types that are going to make use of arrays. Okay. And a few helper functions to be used with arrays if. Is vowel, is odd, is first odd, is ready for a pair. So basically comparing or checking if the first uh, element in that pair is odd or not. First one is erase. You can erase a character inside a string, or you can erase uh, elements inside a vector or inside a list, among other things. First one, we remove U from the string Visual Studio. One thing worth, uh, worth noting is the studio experimental functions of the same name have been deprecated. So if you try to uncomment this and compile, compile it, it will give you the warning that you see here.
the second demo or the second example we are going to use raise if and we similar to the first one we are going to print a list before and after erasing uh, the value given erase if takes a container and a function or a struct with a function that turns bool for a true for turns a bool true if you should be erasing it or false otherwise so for example in this we want to raise odd ones so one three five and seven and so on should be erased here the function will erase only the uh, the first odd so if the first member of the, of the first element is a pair and this map is odd then it's going to be erased so 1 10 330 550 and so on then all the map is just the same let's take a look, quick look at the demo okay. so in each of these you can see before erasing after erasing First one, this has been the easiest. So I uh, has been sorry, uh, U has been erased. Visual Studio, so now this house to Studio, nice name. And the number of elements have been decremented appropriately accordingly in each of the examples. Here it has removed all the vowels. Of course, uh, erase if it is a much more versatile, versatile uh, tool and can be used in a number of ways. Okay. Let's go back to the slides. So is constant evaluated? This feature is contributed by Jennifer and Stefan from the MSVC team, who work on the compiler and libraries teams respectively. The feature is also both a mix of compiler and standard library features. Is constant evaluated allows developers to know if an expression in their program will be evaluated as constant at compile time. Depending on the result of that evaluation, they can provide different implementations for each. The paper have several has several good examples that explain when the use of the evaluation will be useful. Also, here's a demo showing how it can be used. Is a constant evaluated is a very useful function whenever we want to optimize based on the knowledge whether the compiler is evaluating an expression as a constant or not. So in these examples, we are altering how square works if it is constant similarly so if it's constant we just add a thousand it's a very large number so we can easily recognize it as the output similarly we look at cube we also add a very large number here 2000 to the output and then we look at all the cases here we have various cases the squiggles here is is valid it's been the ide is warning us that because square is a const exp expression then we could actually add const to the end however we're not adding that to see how the compiler was a compiler would do uh, this is the same case here okay uh, however in the case of cube it didn't give us a similar warning merely because int cube is not const we would need to uncomment that to see it for ourselves okay let's look at all these examples and see the output and compare it to how each function is defined, or how each expression is, uh, is declared. So in the first case, there's no const or const exp, so we get a small number, which means it actually didn't go through the optimizer. So we print its actual value. In the second and third cases, it actually didn't go through the optimizer because const and const exp mean, meant the compiler is actually evaluated it as a constant uh, expression. So it's constantly evaluated, uh, it's true. As a final example, because, or it's a final example for square, we passed val a, which is not a constant uh, argument, so it could evaluate it as constant. 
Of course, in these two, the cube examples, it wasn't able to evaluate it as a constant merely because cube is not constant itself. Now, we don't have an example similar to const exp here, like this one, mainly because the compiler would fail to build that uh, because cube is not const exp. Let's go back to the slides now. Const expert for algorithms and utility. This is another feature related to const experts. It's, it's being contributed by Billy from the MSVC libraries team. This feature doesn't add any new functions. Instead, it adds const expert modifiers to functions in algorithm and utility headers. There are a few other C++20 accepted proposals that also propose adding const exp to existing functions. However, I guess this one is the largest in terms of the number of const exp modifiers added. By adding const exp algorithms functions, those algorithms can in turn be used in other const exp functions or expressions. Here's a demo showing when that would be useful. So, const exp for algorithms. Previously in C17, many of the algorithms in, those, in these examples here did not have the const exp modifier applied to them. However, with a proposal here, uh, P0202, uh, the const exp modifier has been applied to many, in fact, most of the algorithms uh, and, and algorithm header as well as a utility header. So let's look at some of the examples that did not build before. So this is the only one that would have built in uh, 2017. However, all the other examples here wouldn't have been built, mainly because uh, corresponding algorithms in, in 17 uh, did not have the cost X modifier. Okay. An interesting example, apart from the ones using cost X, is static assert, which uses the same mechanism under the hood. So now because Something like this is sorted because uh, we added the const exp to uh, a sorted algorithm. Now something like this will work. Of course, if you actually change the array to be something like 1, 3, 4, 5, for example, then something like this would not build. Here are a few other examples for functions that, has, that could be compiled with const exp, mainly because the uh, code inside it have algorithms that has a const exp modifier applied. Okay. Span. Span is one of the most popular library features of C++20. Span's implementation has been contributed by MISCO and has been included in VS 2019-16.6. Conceptually, Span is a struct that contains two key members, a pointer to a, to a contiguous sequence of elements and the count of those elements. It's a commonly used pattern, or at least Span encapsulates a commonly used pattern. So this proposal adds to the standard library through a new type. To span and a new header span. The new type is lightweight and has been designed as a value type, so it should be cheap to construct and use. Also, some of you may have already used the type with the same name from the GSL library. Both GSL span and SUS span provide similar functionalities. In fact, StuSpan proposal is based originally on GSL span. And with version 3.0 of GSL span, both types are now more aligned than ever. However, there are a couple of differences. Mainly, GSL spans adds bounds checking. Also, GSL span can be used in any C++ version starting with 14, including 17 and 20. While SUSPAN is C20 only, you can read more about GSL span in the blog post shown here. Okay, 
Here's a demo for StuSpan. For the Span demo, we will show how to create a Span, uh, modify the elements inside it, as well as how to iterate over the elements inside the Span. Creation is straightforward. You basically pass, uh, provide a type as your argument, a template argument, and pass whatever type you that is allowed by span. Vectors, ints, uh, arrays, interrays, all of these types are okay. Mainly because they have a contiguous uh, range of elements that you can, uh, that, that can, uh, span can make use of. So in the second example, modify, we actually try to iterate over all the elements and change the first letter to the uppercase of it. So S and V and C are going to all be changed to the uppercase of them. And in the final example here, we show different ways of iterating over the elements as span points to. So This example here is use the column or use uh, the, the normal begin, or, or sorry, the, the ones that are commonly used for iterating over uh, containers begin and end, or even use the old fashioned from int i equals zero to or size ti equals zero to, to the end of the elements. Okay. We have a couple of helper functions to print here print span. So print span will print all the elements inside the span together with a size. So let's take a look see how that works. So first in the create span demo, after creating each of those elements, we print, so print a span, so elements one to four works. We print a span from the vector directly or from <coughs> another span, okay, which both will have the same element, or using the begin and end uh, members of the vector. As a modifier, as you can see, before and after. So before, we had uh, the elements inside uh, were not up, uh, do not start with an uppercase, but after we modified the first character for each of them to upper, now they are all uppercase, start with an uppercase. For iteration, the second one is the most interesting because we were able to iterate from end to beginning. That's why we use a reverse begin, R begin, and R end here. R begin to R end. Okay. Now let's go back to the slides. The last feature I'd like to demo today, but certainly not the least, is ranges. I guess it's popular enough, so I won't spend too much time explaining what it does. However, there are a couple of things I'd like to mention about ranges. First, it's a really big feature. Really big. The merged one ranges proposal is 223 pages long, which makes it very takes a very long time to implement and review, of course. Also, ranges is the first C20 feature that makes use of C20, uh, C20 concepts. MSVC toolset has implemented the compiler and library component of concepts in VS 2019 update 16.3. And since then, Casey Carter has been, who is a contributor for uh, ranges features, he has been contributing ranges features to MSVC SCL since then. Here's a look at the progress made so far. The starting point for ranges implementation has been the completion of concepts. Okay. And since then, a lot has been implemented, including some machinery, including some concepts, or a lot, or I think all the concepts have been implemented, and some algorithms as well. Um, not all ranges features have been done yet, so they won't be easy to demonstrate today. So for my next demo, I'll be showing one of the relatively complete features of ranges, which is ranges algorithms. Here it is. So 
this is a Rangers demo, our final demo for today. And uh, we are going to focus on the Rangers algorithm. There are various algorithms that have been implemented for Rangers. However, we are going to focus on these three only copy, copy, find, and any of. You also have a few helper functions to help to help us with um, demonstrating uh, how the ranges algorithms work. The first one is a copy, a copy from one range to another. We we'll use copy if, very similar to the other, like raise if the one we have used. In this one, for example, it will only copy numbers that are divisible by three, or in this one uses a lambda function to determine if the numbers are positive or actually non, not negative. So anything zero or larger will be copied. Find, we're going to try to find uh, uh, elements as an element, the number 23, and this array of stood pairs using the get second. So this is very powerful. It allows us to combine several things in, in, into one. So we're going to focus on uh, the second element only. So we're trying to find anything that's, that ends with 23. So there's only one here, for example, so that will return true. Here, we're trying to see if the, one of the first pair have 70, uh, the first element in the pair have 73 or not. Obviously, it doesn't, so this one should return false. The final demo is for the any of algorithms for ranges, ranges any of. And for that example, we are going to uh, make use of uh, two functions, even is even and is, uh, is odd. And we are going to only copy, uh, sorry, uh, we're going to look for values inside our pair where it's either even or odd and one time using the first element in the pair and the second time using the second element in the pair. So let's see a look, take a look at how this works. So the copy demo, the first one was straightforward, it copied everything. Second one, it only copied numbers that are divisible by three. And the third one, it copied only functions, uh, sorry, uh, values that are not negative, 0, 15, 25. And it obviously, it of course, it copied them in the same order they were created. No surprises in the find and ranges. So everything uh, that ended in 23, which is really only one, was found. However, nothing that started with 73 could be found. Finally, in the any if demo, the output was based on if it's even or odd. So we arrange it as even first, yes, found some, yes, no, it didn't have anything, nothing has an even second, everything adds an odd number, 13, 13, and 13, however, there are odd first and, and odd like seven here, and odd seconds, which is really everything. Okay, that has been our last demo for the day, let's go back to our presentation. We are almost at the end of our presentation. Thank you for staying with me so far. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about today is what we can do together to make the STL a better library. First, I'd like to ask you to try the latest and greatest features of the STL, which you can find at the GitHub repo. Or if you prefer, you can download the latest preview of ES, which will also contain the latest, maybe not the up to date exactly with the GitHub, but it will contain the latest merged from GitHub. If you have any questions about STL features or questions, then please report it in GitHub. If you have any other questions about Visual Studio or any other general questions about C++, then uh, that are not STL specific, 
example, a Posa compiler or other library uh, libraries out there, then the VS developer community is a larger forum and that can be used for asking such questions. Finally, I'd like to say big, big thank you very much for the wonderful community contributors to the SCL GitHub repo. By contributing, contributing code and time and asking questions and opening issues, you are making a real difference in the C++ community. Once again, thank you. Here are some useful links. You already know about the GitHub repo. I believe I've mentioned around 12,000 times or so, so you must know it by far. Microsoft SCL on GitHub.com. This is a link for the C++ STL, a reference. And finally, the visual, uh, sorry, the virtual CPP repo at github.com uh, under msala msft is where you can find uh, this PowerPoint presentation as well as any of the demo code. Okay, we have reached the end of this presentation. So thank you, everyone. Please enjoy the rest of virtual CP and please stay safe. Okay, and that marks the end of Pure Virtual C++ 2020. Uh, thanks so much for everyone who joined us. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed the talks as much as I have. It would be really great if you could take a little bit of time to fill in our survey, which is just uh, up here. Um, I will leave the, the chat open for another uh, 10 minutes or so, so that you have time to ask any, any last questions. But uh, yeah, please send us your feedback. Uh, let us know if you would like to see any more events like this or just like one-off streams or chats with our team. Um, and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.